Cindy, are you here? I am, yes. Okay, so this is a little confusing because I got all these emails yesterday. So if you can help me out. So the panel starts at what time? Let me pull it up for you because what I've got, um, what I show is 8.30, so. Yeah, and, but, but then the invite says 10, 15 to 11, and so. Let me, let me um, find that out for you and I will get right back with you, okay? Thank you. You bet. Good morning, everyone. We are slated to get started at nine o'clock, so appreciate everyone being here. Feel free to talk amongst yourselves or ask me any questions that you have. or we'll play the quiet game. I'm sorry, I thought I was um, unmuted there. Ms. Williams, I wanted to let you know that um, I did get that information. Um, Joe had sent you a calendar invite, so hopefully you've got that, but your panel starting at 1015. Yes, so I, that was the confusion. The, the calendar invite said 1015, but the Zoom said 830, so. Gotcha. Yeah, thank you so much. You bet. We're glad you're here. Thank you. And we decided to set the meeting up a little bit early just so people could congregate if they had any questions or wanted to discuss. So we've got about 30 minutes before the official program begins. Sorry if that there was any confusion with that.
you know, Sandy, you type something like that. I want to do my best Hannibal Lecter impression. So, so Joseph, this is our time to ask some questions. Um, I, uh, I was able to sit in um, on a meeting that Cindy Munson was a part of. Um, and one of the things that she mentioned was, um, was the special session that's going to be happening that, you know, it's going to focus around redistrict redistricting. Um, do you see there being any chance it's gonna, um, how that's gonna affect um, kind of the work that we do? You have any opinion on that? So the redistricting, just for those of you who are not aware how the system works, uh, redistricting happens every 10 years based upon the census count. The lawmakers will get the data from the federal government, the Census Bureau, they will have staff go through and crunch the numbers and figure out how many people live in each building block of, of the, the state, the precincts. And then they will table those up to make sure that there is as close to equal population in each of the legislative districts as you can get based upon that count. The 101 House seats and 48 Senate seats and five congressional districts will all be uh, determined through that research, that work, the staff and the lawmakers working together to come up with what will be the best design for those districts with that population. They have put together a preliminary report to comply with our constitution that required something be done. Uh, but it was, uh, slowed down this year, obviously, because of the pandemic. We didn't have the numbers. The state had to pass something to uh, be in compliance with the Constitution. They're going to come back into a special session in early November to vote for the districts that have been proposed. And unless I'm mistaken, we haven't seen an actual design for the congressional districts yet. I know there have been some maps floated around and there's been some input from the public and there's a, a strong likelihood of what one of the districts is probably going to look like uh, or one of the maps is going to look like for the five congressional districts. But the legislative districts have basically been set. They will go back through and determine if their numbers were off and they used preliminary data from an early count from the census from 2018. And I have heard that some of the district numbers are significantly off based upon the count uh, in those areas, the actual count. They'll have to go through and tinker with some of those lines. Um, with the, the, the makeup of the legislature with 82 Republicans, 19 Democrats in the House and uh, 39 Republicans and nine Democrats in the Senate, uh, basically the majority party is gonna have the say of what they want. And, We'll have to wait and see if the members of Congress will have more of an input in what their districts look like as has been in years past, or if the legislature will draw the lines that they want to put out there. Uh, generally, it happens where the, uh, the congressional members have input of what they want. They Five of them will get together and look and see uh, what they prefer as far as the uh, district lines and, and haggle that out, out themselves and then give that to the state lawmakers. So. It's going to be interesting to see how it all shakes down in November, especially since it's October 20th. And we still haven't seen it, something definite yet. At any rate, uh, I, Did that email, answer you, uh, I have you been did. adding more people who have been emailing last night and this morning. I think I've got everybody added in. <clears throat> um, I went in last night. Thank you so much for the link you sent me about the polling. It did let me pre-add in a poll. Andy, did that answer your question? 
It is a great explanation, Joe. Thanks. I'm just, um, it's, it's curious. Like you say, it's going to be interesting in November because um, it was mentioned the same thing that some of those numbers were significantly off. So. Yeah, so the, that's a credit to the Census Bureau workers who got out in the field and worked so hard. Oklahoma was one of the first states to open back up as far as the census workers getting out in the field. And while I personally was disappointed we didn't reach my goal of 4 million, we fell 55,000 short. So that's not too bad a consolation. Uh, we know there are far more people out there. In fact, if anybody uh, saw it on Twitter this morning, um, the Ardmorite did a story about the census count and interviewed me about that and the impact of rural areas because far too many rural citizens did not respond to the census. Right. And because of that, the district lines are gonna be larger. You're not going to have truly an equal representation and people that don't fill out the census are cheating the state and themselves out of resources that could be applied to help cover some of these programs that are still gonna be there. People are still gonna ask for that help. And we're simply not gonna get the money from the feds because it's all determined by the census count. So people that don't respond to the census are hurting their friends, neighbors, themselves, and the state. Just to be blunt. So I'll ask a blood question there, Joe. In the rural areas, is there still distress? I mean, they could have got online and done it, right? It's 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 not like they really had to have a census worker knocking on their door. Um, and I do understand not everybody has technology, but is there is some of the reason still that distrust of the government? I uh, I felt very fortunate to be a member of the Partnership for America's Children representing OICA in Washington, D.C. Uh, a couple of years ago, pre-pandemic, I guess it was late 2019. And we had the director of the Census Bureau uh, over the area that handled the, the mailings come in. And then on my birthday last year, when we were doing the count, the actual Census Bureau director came through. And we indicated to both of them that there were problems in the rural area because of the broadband access. A lot of people had to go to their public library if they have a library and use the free Wi-Fi to sign up just because oh, we've seen the numbers, 25% of kids in the state didn't have access to broadband when we went to virtual learning last year. There are a lot of issues in the rural areas with that. Uh, you compound it with Rush Springs, my hometown, you cannot receive mail at a physical address. You have to own a post office box to get mail in Rush Springs. No ifs, ands, or buts. And that is a, a harm to individuals based upon economics. Sure. Uh, I, had, I had fought year after year with the Postal Service as a state representative, not got in, had not gotten anywhere with trying to get that changed. Brought it up to the current Congresswoman in the fifth district and the previous congresswoman about those issues and others in the delegation, including Tom Cole, my former congressman, uh, this is something that needed to be fixed. And I will say that things did get fixed for the census this year. Uh, when they saw the poor turnout in rural areas, uh, they did do a mailing to box holders instead of to the individual at the address telling them how to do it. Now, my mom called into the Census Bureau and they said, we'll wait for a census worker to come around. Well, that's not a smart thing to say during a pandemic. Uh -huh. so finally, they did allow those individuals to respond and the numbers did start creeping up. My, my fear is it was far too late and that hurt the count because people probably got disillusioned or frustrated and didn't respond. So that's something we're gonna keep hammering on. Uh, the advocates that were working together on the census for the count in Oklahoma and this last one have agreed we're going to stay assembled for those of us that don't retire or expire before the next census count. Uh, we're going to try and continue to meet regularly and talk about the issues that we faced and try and have a plan in place. Um, Kevin Stitt, our governor, got very involved in the census and it was truly the first administration we've seen in a couple of censuses that got that engaged. Uh, 
you had a couple of the, the governors that walked in midterm or uh, were leaving office around the time the census happened or just really didn't have that much of an interest in the census in the previous few. And so Brent Kissling, the director for the Commerce Department, the agency responsible for working with the census, Oklahoma submitted more households than any other state in the nation, not per capita, any other, st any other state, period. And so the numbers there, I really thought we were going to have a good shot at picking up a census rest of this with the amount of new households that were turned down. But it, it just simply didn't come to pass because people didn't respond to the census the way we hoped they would. And it was a tremendous effort across the nonprofit spectrum, working very hard to do that. The Commerce Department under uh, Director Kissling reached out and they had a complete count committee, I believe in every single county and a lot of communities had it. Oklahoma City and Tulsa had a fantastic competition between each other uh, to try and get the numbers up. Uh, it was a lot of fun. OICA in our part, we ran a competition for communities and uh, committed to make a donation to a school district that uh, where the community that had the most improvement on the count was located. And so that was one up uh, by Nawada and they actually turned down the donation. So we didn't mind not having to give that money out, but uh, we appreciated the communities getting so involved. And I was really happy Sandy, uh, Sandy Foster is one of our board members from down the lot and Sterling and Madison Park were two of the most improved uh, communities in the state from account from May to the end of the census. So I was glad to see our area really step up and, and show improvement in the numbers of what we needed. Absolutely. Thanks. I think that's um, probably due a lot into some great leadership. So thanks for your leadership in this also, Joe. Well, and you're right on that part. It was the local leadership there. Uh, we got some great community leaders down there. I'm, I'm especially fond of the mayor of Medicine Park. And we he's all a, are. <laughs> he's a former OICA board member and a donor to OICA still. Um, it, it takes that leadership up and down the spectrum to really make these things happen. I know the Municipal League was very engaged because they recognize the need for the road funding that comes to the communities. And the state, uh, Director Kissling was the complete count committee director for Garfield County 10 years ago. So he stepped in knowing what was required of the census, but probably the unsung hero in all of that was John Chappie over at the Department of Commerce. He was the staffer over the census 10 years ago and saw what was missed out 10 years ago and did everything in his power to correct that this year and really stepped up and did a great job. And the rest of the team at the Department of Commerce did a fantastic job with their uh, OK, Let's Count campaign. Sorry, I had to take a drink of my coffee. Two guarantees that come from this fall form by the end of it. I will have a hoarse voice and y'all are going to be sick of my voice by the time it's over. As we said, we're getting started in just a few minutes. Uh, if anybody has any questions, feel free to shoot them my way. hope everyone is having a good morning. We're going to be talking about some pretty heavy issues over the next four days, but the best part about this is we're also going to be talking about solutions and things we need to do to fix the problems. Yes, sir.
And for those of you who are logging on, we'll get started in just a minute. And check out Peyton's message in the chat room. Yes, please take our pre-event survey. Yes, please. That is a requirement for one of our grants. So help us not go broke. I'm on a Zoom. Peyton, you're in charge for a second. I'm going to go refill my coffee before we get started. Sounds good. Peyton's our policy director. If anybody has any really tough policy questions you'd like to ask her. Uh -huh. It's a little too, too early for, for that, but thank you, Joe. <laughs> but yes, thank, thank you all, you all for, for attending. We're very excited. And we have more and more people logging on. We'll uh, we'll continue to post that link that Peyton has uh, uh, throughout the morning session. Uh, we'll really use the Jamboard um, as it gets uh, into the policy sessions. We'll go into more of that. Peyton's going to post that link in a few minutes. Um, we've got a pre-event survey that we will need folks to to fill out. And we'll send that out in an email also to 
individuals to make sure that you have that. And we would appreciate you sending that back in, filling that out for us so uh, we can comply with one of the grants in which we received. We had several very generous donors uh, provide support for the conference. Uh, we'll go through and thank them in just a little bit, but I want to thank everyone for being on here. We will get going in just a couple of minutes. We should have had some music playing for y'all. I'll throw in my Jimmy Buffett CD into my computer tomorrow. And those of you that like Mr. Buffett can enjoy and the rest of you probably will just mute me. Y'all are a tough crowd. Of course, it doesn't help when all of you are muted. Uh, I enjoyed it. <laughs> good deal. By the way, I'm, good with, I'm, I'm good with the music. I think we just all need to let our espresso kick in, Joe. <laughs> I hear you there. So probably sharing too much personal information. I got to spend all day and Sunday in bed with an ulcer flare up. So nothing like a conference to trigger your body. <laughs> Fortunately, we've got a really good team that's making this possible. Uh, our staff really stepped up at OICA to pull off this conference. I hope it delivers the way we expect it's going to uh, for everything that we want to do as far as shaping our legislative agenda and kicking things off. We appreciate all of y'all for being a part of this. It's our pleasure. Good morning. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see so many smiling faces, even if it's mostly pictures across the top. We are not going to make everybody uh, turn their video on because I know that that's probably taboo this early in the morning until everyone's had their coffee, so cheers. I want to thank everyone for being here for Fall Forum 2021. Oh, Beverly, I, you have never heard me karaoke. Uh, we don't want to automatically drop the numbers in half people starting off with my singing. That would be a trauma that many of you would not be able to recover from, I'm afraid. Fall Forum is in its 21st year. Ann Roberts started this back in 2000, and uh, it's been an amazing experience to be a part of this as a lawmaker at the beginning, and then through the years, watch how it's progressed, and then now to help shape the agenda and shape the discussions that lead to a legislative agenda for child advocates that we will take to lawmakers and encourage them to file in legislation and then hopefully see success. Uh, our team at OICA, along with the many, many advocates out there and the organizations they represent, uh, do work at the Capitol, uh, whether it's official lobbying or 
It's advocacy work, uh, using your voice as a citizen to try and help shape better policy for the youth of Oklahoma. That's the entire goal of this conference is to come up with a legislative agenda and then along the, uh, the way, learn a little bit about each other and the work that we're doing so we can work as a team of advocates together, trying to promote the best interests of Oklahoma's children. My name is Joe Dorman. I'm the CEO for the Oklahoma Institute for Child Advocacy. Uh, just about a month ago, I celebrated my fifth anniversary at OICA. And it's been an amazing run so far, just with what we've seen here at the Institute and the work that we need, we've been able to do over the last several years, uh, working through two governor's administrations and a lot of lawmakers through turnover with term limits and elections. It's been a fantastic experience to be able to work to help them understand the issues that are going through the system of what they consider with child advocacy, and then also work with those state agencies, uh, sometimes to help promote the work that they're doing, and then sometimes to bring information to them to show where one path they may be taking may not be the best approach based upon data and science and with what we're seeing going around the rest of the nation. OICA is a member of the Partnership for America's Children. At one point uh, later in the week, I believe we're finishing up Friday, we'll get to hear from Deb Stein, who is the head of the Partnership for America's Children. And that's the affiliation of the different organizations like OICA around the United States where we come together regularly and shape ideas. We had our conference a couple of weeks ago and shared input about the different things that are happening. And many of these policies, if you're not aware, are started at the national level, promoted to the different states, and they run them through the different state legislatures to try and build up speed and try and pass them across the spectrum across the United States. And then try and sometimes bring that to the federal side to the US Congress for consideration. So we work as a team to help watch these ideas, discuss what the impact might be, and then work on those real solutions. And of course, a lot of this has been monitoring and working uh, with what we're seeing at the federal administration. Uh, there were some announcements this morning Deb said that her program is probably going to change 15 minutes before she speaks just with the, the fast pace of what we're seeing. And there, was, there were announcements this morning on some concessions with the federal legislation of what we'll see uh, in the three and a half uh, trillion dollar package that Congress is considering. So I think we're gonna have some exciting news to discuss on that. Some will be happy, some will not be happy. That's unfortunately the way the system works. I want to go ahead and turn this over to our board president, Bruce Schultz. Um, Bruce uh, stepped in as board president a year ago and has been a fantastic leader for OICA. We have a board of 23 uh, citizens right now who are working together to help our staff and our team uh, keep focus and the direction of which way we need to go with OICA. We always have the opportunity for people to step into either a board position or a committee position. Uh, our newest appointee was Dan Billingsley, which many of you will recognize that name. He is serving on our, our policy committee, uh, and uh, he's going to be a fantastic voice in that with his experience. So any of you that have an interest in that, we would certainly welcome you to be a part of that. Uh, Mr. President, if you're ready, we'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Joe. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yes, sir. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yes. Well, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll spare you my, my uh, morning uh, picture here because uh, as uh, I've been told, I have a face made for radio. So um, good morning to every one of you. Again, my name is Bruce Schultz, as Joe said, board president. And on behalf of the Board of Directors for OICA, I and the staff, I also want to extend our warmest welcome to each of you as we kick off this year's OICA Virtual Fall Forum. And we are very honored and excited that you've all chosen to take time out of what I know are busy schedules to attend these virtual discussions and sessions that we have set up for the next four days. As th those of you, probably most of you who've attended know, Fall Forum has a multi-pronged -pr purpose. It's first, uh, it is where child advocates from across Oklahoma gather to discuss the pressing issues and challenges that are facing Oklahoma's youth. Second, it serves as a venue for which ideas and policy solutions intended to solve these challenges are presented and where the different educational sessions are held to help raise awareness of these different issues. 
Our hope is that through these activities, Fall Forum is where Oklahoma's child advocates can help to shape OICA's legislative agenda for the upcoming year. And as Joe has spoken to this, and as you'd see on our website, OICA's advocacy is data-driven, and it seeks to promote best practices and support policies that are backed by sound research and data. And Fall Forum is an integral part of that process. We are excited at this year's lineup of experts and different topic discussions. This year, you're going to see panels covering a wide array of topics and issues from children's mental and physical health to food insecurity, economic stability, child welfare, juvenile justice, and broadband access. We'll also be hearing an update from the federal level and having a discussion with Oklahoma lawmakers. So with all that in mind, we want to encourage you to be asking questions, share your thoughts, let us know of trends in the different data you're seeing in the different areas of advocacy in which you work. I'm a firm believer we can never have too much input when it comes to the challenges facing Oklahoma's kids. And it's that input which not only helps to raise awareness, but also makes it more likely that we're going to find the opportunities to solve these challenges. And in the end, improve the lives of many of our youth to provide a brighter tomorrow for them and for our state as a whole. I would be remiss if I didn't thank all the generous donors who through their support have helped to make Fall Forum possible this year, including the Schusterman Family Foundation, the Merrick Family Foundation, Arnold Family Foundation, PACOM, and the Tobacco Settlement Endowment Trust, and any others that I might have missed that I'm sure Joe will also make sure we get added to that list. We want to say a thank you to each of our panelists and speakers taking time to help to raise the awareness on the specific issues that they're going to be addressing. And I also, on behalf of the board, want to thank our CEO, Joel Dorman, and his amazing OICA team that he leads for all the work they put into making this year's fall forum the best yet. And of course, our thanks to each of you for being part of the discussion. I'd like to leave us with a final thought about what it means to raise awareness. This past year, I was visiting with our daughter, daughter Abby, who is pursuing her early childhood education degree at OSU. And we were discussing the topic of ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, and more specifically how the toxic stress that results from these experiences unfortunately play such a prominent role in that child's future socioeconomic outcomes. Now, I have to say, my 20-year-old daughter was surprised, albeit pleasantly, that her old dad, someone with an economics degree from O State and a career mm -hmm. background in finance, very surprised that I even knew what the acronym ACEs meant. Uh, and stood for. And I told her, well, it was my participation with OICA that it educated me, and it helped me to understand the very real challenges that face many of our state's children, whether it's the 20% of our children living in poverty, the one in four who are food insecure, the one in 10 who have an incarcerated parent, the 25% of rural children who lack access to high-speed broadband, or the roughly 20% of foster children nationwide who become homeless after aging out of the system. All of these are things which OICA has helped make me aware of, and hopefully a better educated and better engaged citizen, despite the fact that my day job is not specifically in child advocacy. My point is this, child advocacy has many allies who are not full-time advocates, but who are ready to become passionate advocates in whatever way they can. All people of goodwill, regardless of their political identification, want a better future for our state's kids. So I wanna challenge and encourage each of you to not only share and provide input over the next four days, but to take from this fall forum what you hear and learn and share it with your networks, within your circles of family, friends, influence, as well as stay connected with everyone here. If you're not presently a member of the OICA, I would strongly encourage you to visit our website at oica.org and go to the Get Involved tab and from there select Become a Member, where you can learn more about the different levels of membership that we offer. Together, we can help achieve the goal of OICA and all of us on this call, all of Oklahoma's child advocates, which is to ensure that every child in Oklahoma from birth to adulthood is nurtured, healthy, educated, protected from harm, and thriving. Thank you again for your attendance, for your work for Oklahoma's children, and for your support of OICA. Joe? Thank you, Mr. President. I very appreciate your service, as well as our other board members. And we had a very good uh, rate of uh, registration from our board members uh, signing up for the conference. I know we'll have probably every single one of them uh, attending at some point throughout the week. And we know, uh, and I had this discussion uh, with uh, one of our friends who's actually on here right now, his name's at the top of my list. 
he didn't want to sign up originally just because he knew he wouldn't be able to attend the entire event. I want you to know, we understand your schedules are busy. Uh, we fully intend for this to be a come and go event. Uh, we want you to be here as much as you possibly can, especially during the advocate sessions. Uh, we want to make sure that we have as much of your voice as we possibly can, as well as others. And the registration will remain open uh, throughout the next couple of days. So we know some people um, may be busy today, but they can attend for one day. I know we've got one person that will uh, only be here on Monday, and that's great. We just want to make sure your voice is here as much as it possibly can be and be active. As Bruce said, we have a lot of sponsors that help make this possible. Uh, this is the first year that we've been able to make this free for advocates. So we did charge the state agencies because uh, some of the parameters of some of the grants were that this be for uh, nonprofits. Uh, so we appreciate those state agency uh, employees and uh, the, our state uh, workers who signed up and were able to attend. Uh, we wanna thank those advocates who carved out the time in their day to make a difference uh, in this conversation. I do wanna go through and thank the sponsors. Uh, we had, in no particular order, the Schusterman Family Foundation, the Charles and Lynn Schusterman Family Foundation out of Tulsa uh, was one of our very first sponsors to sign up and got the ball rolling. Uh, with this idea to provide scholarship spots for individuals to be able to attend. Uh, the Chickasaw Nation, the Cherokee Nation, the Love Meyer Family Foundation, PACOM, and thank you, AJ Griffin, one of our board members, the Merrick Family Foundation, Liberty Dental Plan, Delta Dental, the Delta Dental of Oklahoma Foundation, the Oklahoma Oral Health Coalition, Oklahoma Complete Health, the Oklahoma Caring Foundation, the Arnall Family Foundation, TSET, and several others who generously donated to make this conference a success. Uh, we'll be hearing from some of these individuals that represent these uh, sponsors uh, throughout the week. I uh, want to especially invite you to attend early tomorrow morning at 845. TSET will be doing a presentation, a vendor fair, so to speak, about what your nonprofit can uh, work with TSET on and the opportunities that TSET has available to support nonprofits and just the resources they can provide to help reduce smoking in Oklahoma, reduce vaping, and improve the health of Oklahomans as a whole. We have got a couple of other items before we get started here in a few minutes. Uh, Christine, do you have the nominees yet? Been looking for this on my email. I've got the video ready for the kick evidence. Excellent. Thank you for keeping me online. I was going to uh, skip her and do the awards and then have her speak. So thanks for keeping me on track. I need to pull the agenda back up. Uh, we're fortunate that we have an opportunity through OICA to work with some of the state's great youth uh, through the awards that we give and some of the programs that we run. Uh, we've had a fantastic uh, program operation that's been built up over the last several years. And one of those favorites with our team is the Kid Governor Program. Uh, this was started several years ago by Jim Priest at Sunbeam Family Services, and they asked OICA to be a collaborative partner on this. Uh, with changes at Sunbeam, they asked us to take over the program completely. And we have one a bit of exciting news that I'm going to announce after we hear from our kid governor. We are very pleased that we had our second two-term governor um, achieve office earlier this month when Charlotte Anderson uh, was approved by our board to have her second term of office. Um, two reasons. Charlotte is amazing. And two, the work that she uh, was able to do in the pandemic really didn't touch on the potential she has. And so as we're seeing things improve and people come together more. We wanted to see Charlotte have that opportunity to be a kid governor who could get out in the state and, and make a difference. And the difference that she has already made has been fantastic. And with that, we're going to hear from Oklahoma's 2021 and 21 22 kid governor, Charlotte Anderson. Can't hear the sound.
You can't hear the sound? Cannot hear the sound. My platform was kids' health, and I never imagined we would still be in a pandemic. But the year has also been amazing. I met with the lieutenant governor, with legislators, with regional directors for the Oklahoma State Department of Health, with advocacy groups, and I even got to give a speech in the school. I gave speeches about kids getting healthy and fit and other ways to improve kids' health, like safe storage of guns. And a speech to kids about in my school about how to use your voice to be our hero. I also talked to them about bullying and how we need to stick together to hold grown-ups accountable. Because sometimes grown-ups are the bully. I'm so very honored to be asking to be there for a second term. I have so many more things I want to accomplish. So let's talk about those. First, we need to get kids' health better. It was, Oklahoma was 49th out of 50 states last year. After my first term, Oklahoma is now 42nd out of 50 states. So we have made some improvement, but it's not perfect. I want us to be number one. We can help kids' health if you keep moms healthy so babies are born healthy. Keep guns away from kids so they don't get hurt. Make sure kids get exercise. Make sure kids get fruits and veggies, no matter where they live in Oklahoma. Let's make Oklahoma sanctuary safe for kids, not guns. Second, I've done some research, and I think kids should have the right to vote from birth. Don't laugh. I'm being serious. This is supposed to be a democracy. One person, one vote. But I'm a person. Why can't I vote? Can you imagine if Oklahoma was the first place for women at the voting age? If you really care about kids and families, shouldn't kids count in the voting process? If families had more power, there would be better policies for families and children. Also, kids make very good decisions. We see and pay attention to things grown-ups don't. Also, oh, we care about everything. We care about world problems and state problems and our friends and neighbors. We care about poverty, planet Earth, and education. Margaret Thatcher almost had it right when she said, in politics, if you want anything said, ask a man. If you want anything done, ask a woman. But I think in politics, if you want anything said, ask a girl. Because they're always talk, talk, talking all the time and not doing. If you want anything done, ask a kid. Because we're always talking and doing. We solve problems. In India, they have a kids' parliament, and they seem more productive and effective than the grown-up parliament. Don't even try the excuse that kids will be pawns of their parents, because that isn't a good argument. That was used when women voting was in question. I spoke to a professor of ethics and evil at Rutgers, and he said everyone is affected by the people around them, and that's okay. Parents can vote for their kids and help their kids vote until their kids can do it for themselves. I don't think I need any help at this point. Don't say that kids don't have good motor skills or can't read because that's like the Jim Crow laws. Those excuses don't work to keep grown-ups from voting, and I won't tolerate them. The thing is, we are very good decision makers, and we will be better decision makers and when you grow up, if you get a start early. And doesn't every parent want their kid to be better than they were? I know everyone is not Christian, but I am. One of my favorite Bible verses is 1 Timothy 4.12. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Don't look down on me because I'm young. Let me vote. Will you help me? If you want to help me or have any questions, get in touch with me through OICA. I think we can do this, people, but we have to work together.
I see some applause going off. Mackenzie, uh, see you on here too. Uh, please thank Charlotte for the service that she has provided to the state for the youth of Oklahoma over the last year. And we're looking forward to her having a very busy session. Uh, we're going to have a lot of things happen. Uh, we're going to hear about some of that in one of our first panels. So we really appreciate the work she's doing. We're going to make sure that that video is posted on our social media and shared. And Charlotte has a Facebook page that's operated by OICA for the kid governor. And as I said, we had an announcement we were going to make about the kid governor. Um, uh, through a strange uh, series of events earlier this year, uh, we were contacted by an organization from Connecticut who had actually trademarked the term kid governor and asked us to uh, stop using that term. I reached out to them, looked at their website and saw that they have an affiliate program. So I contacted them, visited with them about us possibly being an affiliate. And even though it was all in the Northern part of the country, uh, they didn't have anyone down here and just asked why we couldn't be an affiliate. And so through some haggling and negotiating, Oklahoma is going to be the fourth state to participate in the National Kid Governor Program. With that, starting in the school year of 2022, there will be curriculum provided to fifth grade classes over a two to three week lesson plan about civics and elections, about teaching uh, fifth graders, the election process, the process of what officials do, and the classes that participate in this will have the opportunity to submit a video of one of their classmates to enter into competition for the Kid Governor Program. The ICA Board of Directors will narrow that down to a reasonable list and email those videos out to each class that participates. And then those classes will have the opportunity for each student to have one person, one vote, and vote for the next kid governor of Oklahoma. So we truly are turning this into more of a democratic process, uh, teaching them the process of the elections and the importance of elections. And as we have all seen, uh, some personal commentary here, we need more education about how elections work and that there is not as much fraud out there as people want to believe. And we're going to do everything in our power to ensure it is a fair election and that these fifth graders learn the process and hopefully they themselves, when they turn 18, will have the opportunity to vote or if some lawmaker decides to take it upon themselves to deliver what Charlotte would like, uh, at whatever age, have that chance to vote. And so we're glad that Charlotte is going to be the kid governor that helps shepherd that in. And the next year uh, we'll have a process working with the State Department of Education uh, to ensure that that is in as many schools as possible. And I asked uh, Gina Nelson, our former teacher of the year to be on here. And I uh, have an announcement uh, about that too. Christine, I don't have that list seconds. We give away several awards. Uh, Gina, or if you're on here, would you unmute and turn your camera on? Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm doing fabulous today in Washington, D.C. Ah, that's fantastic. Well, I know you're up there doing wonderful work. Do you want to tell everybody uh, who you got to meet yesterday? Um, yeah, two days ago, we were invited by the First Lady and President Biden, uh, along with the 2020 and the 2021 uh, cohort of State Teachers of the Year um, to meet and, uh, and, and be recognized by uh, the President, the First Lady, and Secretary Cardona. Uh, and we will be meeting with lawmakers this week to talk about um, education and advocacy. Fantastic. Well, I wanted to surprise you on something. Uh, OICA gives away several awards each year. Um, some of them at our Heroes Ball, some of them at Fall Forum. One of those uh, that we're most proud of is uh, uh, Laura Choate Resilience Award, and it's given to an individual who's risen above uh, traumatic issues, uh, basically a tough life in their childhood, and risen to influence others and make a difference through the, their work 
and the lives of Oklahomans. And Gina is our 2021 Laura Choate Resilience Award winner. And just from the nomination, I want to read, uh, Gina is a native of Broken Bow whose life was positively impacted by an educator. She made it her mission to continue her mentor's legacy of helping and educating Oklahoma's children. She was the 2020 Oklahoma Teacher of the Year and has helped high school students earn over $4 million in scholarships. Uh, she's advocating for students constantly. And just as you heard of where she's at and what she's doing, she is continuing to make a positive difference. So I'm sorry to surprise you like this. Goodness, I am um, completely surprised and honored and humble. Thank you so much. Well, we know uh, the amazing work you've been doing, uh, just the work that I had the opportunity to work with you in the pandemic. You were the, you and your family were the stars of our first commercial we put out to encourage masking and safety. And we just want to say thank you for the work you've done and you truly are a very deserving winner of the Laura Choate Resilience Award. Well, thank you so much. And thank you to all of you. Um, I actually heard uh, Joanna Hayes this morning talk to all of us. And she quoted, um, she quoted the scriptures when she won the 2016 National Teacher of the Award. And she said, um, you were chosen for a time such as this. And I think about all of the work that all of you have been doing during the pandemic for kids across the state. And I truly feel that this organization was chosen for a time such as this. So thank you for honoring me, but I'm truly honored to be with all of you and to see all the amazing things that you are doing across the state for Oklahoma's kids, kids who are, were just like me. So thank, thank you to all of you. And we do actually have a plaque for you. Unlike our conference, it is not virtual. It is a real thing. And we will get that to you whenever we can all get together and thank you appropriately. Well, thank, thank you again. It, I'm completely surprised. Thank you, guys. Well, have a great rest of your day in D.C. and try and try and drain the swamp up there. Well, I am from McCurtain County, so I'll do my very best. And next, uh, we have another award that we just started a few years ago. Um, when I got involved with OICA, we really wanted to start digging back into the roots of the organization. And Laura was a plaintiff in the Terry D. lawsuit. Laura, Laura is one of our current board members. She was an early staff member of OICA. And the institutional memory that she has brought to the organization about why our organization was created and the reason that we're still fighting to this day to ensure that those problems that we faced back then never pop back up to the level where they at and we continue trying to improve. Uh, it's important that we remain focused on that mission. Uh, through that work and talking with my predecessor, Terry Smith, uh, we had the chance to connect with Stephen A. Novick. Uh, Stephen was the attorney from Legal Aid of Western Oklahoma who represented the seven teenagers who were the plaintiffs in the Terry D lawsuit. So getting to meet Steven, sit down with him, it truly was an amazing experience to hear from him about what it took back then to fight that fight nearly 40 years ago. And for the time period that it took uh, for almost, I believe over a decade to actually get through that lawsuit and see the success that they had and bring about the changes in the system that were needed. OICA at that time decided they wanted to create an award to recognize the work that Stephen did. And we uh, worked on it for a couple of years and finally reached the goal that it was going to be the Stephen A. Novick Child Advocacy Award. And it would recognize an unsung hero in child advocacy, not someone who's rich, not someone who's powerful, not a politician, somebody who is out there working hard day in and day out to make a difference and doesn't do it for the recognition. Uh, sometimes it's their job, sometimes it's their passion, but it's the work that they want to do to see improvement. We had some phenomenal nominations this year. And in fact, the committee couldn't decide between the top three finalists. So they decided they wanted to make it co-winners of the year for 2021 for the Stephen A. Novick Award. And we have three amazing 
winners, two of them are able to be on the call this morning. And so the first one I want to introduce, uh, Mr. Mark Mann, if you would unmute and turn your camera on if you're able. And we are surprising these people today. That's an understatement. <laughs> I'm glad you wore a tie. Uh, uh, yeah. So Mark Mann is a dedicated community advocate and a former president and a current member of the Bricktown Rotary Club, which happens to be my Rotary Club. And no, I did not nominate him. And no, I was not on the selection committee. And he is the vice chairman for the Oklahoma City Public School District. And through his work in the private side, he helps run a charitable event each year, a couple of events actually, that raise money for youth programs in Oklahoma County uh, to try and help uh, young people. Mark, I want to turn it over to you, just tell a little bit about your work and what it feels to, to receive the Stephen A. Novick Award. Well, I'm a, I'm a little shocked, Joe, so I, I, I don't really know what to say. Um, other than I'm honored and, and, and humbled, um, you know, I've always felt like what OICA does uh, is probably the most important work in the state uh, in terms of, of OICA and all the member organizations and what you do uh, in terms of advocacy on mental health issues or child welfare or juvenile justice, or uh, I saw on the agenda somewhere broadband access, which is a, a huge issue uh, on the education side. And I've always felt like, um, to quote Ann Richards from Texas, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And thanks to all of uh, the groups that make up OICA, our children in the state have someone that has a seat at the table that's advocating for them. So I, I'm honored that you have picked me. I don't know that that um, I, I'm shocked. What, what I do outside of being on the school board is we have uh, a series of fundraisers. Um, we have a lobster feed where we fly lobsters in from Maine and we have a couple other big events that we raise money for always a, a children's charity or a school. Uh, we've raised money for OICA, Oklahoma Lawyers for Children, which I sit on the board of, um, Pivot, which used to be Youth Services, which I used to be on the board of before I got on the Oklahoma City Board. So um, always kind of focused on that area. That's kind of where my interest is. And so to, to be singled out is, is humbling and an honor. And I, I thank you. I don't really know what else to say other than thank you. Well, thank you, my friend. We appreciate the work that you're doing, the work we know you'll continue to do and just keep doing great things in the community. Thanks, thank you. And as I said, we have two other awards. And so the next person, uh, I saw him on here a few minutes ago and I hope he's still on, uh, Mr. Kevin Evans, if you would unmute and turn your uh, video on. Kevin has led the Western Plains Youth and Family Services for 28 years with their organization and continues to do work uh, with youth uh, through the juvenile detention centers, uh, trying to honestly humanize the process more by providing counseling services, working to get these kids the education, the healthcare that they need and make a difference in their lives. Uh, Kevin's and Western Plains have been nominated a couple of times for our organizational uh, group of the year at the Heroes Ball. This was his first nomination as an individual, and I can tell you Kevin is certainly uh, well-deserving to be a co-honoree. So, Kevin, it's all yours. I'm shocked, Joe. <laughs> but thank you so much. The work you guys do is tremendous. Uh, you make a difference every single day. <clears throat> this group that you're looking at uh, all across the board here are all winners in my mind. So I want to say thank you. I'm really proud of Western Plains, what we've done. We just finished our infant mental health and early childhood building. Um, in the work we do in our detention center, I think is kind of groundbreaking. Uh, we're also hoping to build two child development centers, one here and one in Guyman. So we've got a lot of work ahead of us. And I appreciate this. I can't say thank you enough. Thank you. Well, you're well deserving, my friend. We appreciate everything that you're doing out there. And we know that what you will continue to do. And I don't believe our third winner could be on here. Uh, Clotilde Howard, if you're on, please unmute, but I don't believe you were able to join us. Uh, she is Novick Award and CEO and founder of Hope for the Future, which is a nonprofit super supervised visitation center. Clotilde works countless hours, many late nights and long weekends, making sure every family she comes in contact with has their needs met. Uh, she has been a CASA for 13 years and just continues to do a fantastic mission. So. 
um, want to say thank you to the three of you. As I said, it was it was impossible for the committee after long hours to decide which of you is the most deserving because it's obvious all three of you are tremendously deserving of this. So we want to thank all of you for the work you're doing, what we know you will continue to do, and just encourage you to keep doing great things. All right, now we are going to get moving on the agenda. We are a few minutes behind. Uh, so I want to go ahead and kick things off with our first panel. Um, we want to start things off with this discussion because we know uh, this is going to be a very interesting topic and something that so many of us will have the opportunity to work on. And it is our kid governor's agenda, what she set as her primary uh, plank in her platform. And so we felt it was appropriate to start off with children's health and a healthier opportunity for Oklahoma's youth by getting more active and having those, those chances to, to work to try and, and reduce childhood obesity and improve health conditions. Uh, we have two fantastic panelists that we want to start things off with. Uh, Julie Bisbee, who's the executor, executive director of the Tobacco Settlement Endowment Trust and a former employee of the Oklahoma Institute for Child Advocacy along with my friend Trey Rahel, who is the Chief Strategy and Innovation Officer for the Oklahoma Healthcare Authority. We've all been working together on a project. I know it's not ready to be announced yet, but we want the two of you to touch on uh, what we can expect, what we should look at, and what we can do as advocates to see a healthier Oklahoma for kids in 2022. So I'll turn it over to you, Julie. Hey, good morning. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you to Kid Governor. That was fantastic and very cute. Um, yeah. So, you know, a lot of the work that we do at TSET focuses on communities and how communities can help support um, healthy choices, not just outside of school doors, but also within. Um, and so, I would love to have a conversation with Trey about a new initiative that is going on. And then also, um, you know, kind of give you guys an overview. I don't know, Joe, if you've got questions that you want to kick us off or you just want us to be organic and take it away. Well, first thing, uh, it's, it's not so secret. Governor Stitt announced in a cabinet meeting uh, earlier this year that he wanted for 2022, the focus of the part, well, at least one of the focuses in their administration was to tackle childhood obesity in Oklahoma. And he said is one of those champions out there uh, working with OICA uh, for the Fit Kids Coalition and the work that has happened through the years. Um, what What is TSET doing? What are some of the things advocates can do to uh, reach out to TSET and work with y'all to help promote uh, tobacco use uh, reduction, vaping reduction, uh, looking at the grants of what can help with uh, supporting local projects. Sure, sure. Well, if I can, um, I will share my screen. I have a few slides here that might be a little more interesting than my talking head. Um, let's see. So uh, many of you are probably familiar with TSEP, but just as a reminder, we were created by voters um, after our state, along with 46 other states, sued Big Tobacco for their efforts to mislead the public, market to children. Some of you might remember Joe Camel and other cartoons that marketed cigarettes to children. And so we were created by voters in 2000 and affirmed by voters in 2020. So thank you if any of you supported TSET efforts in this last uh, November election. And we work on programs that support prevention, um, primarily tobacco use, but also we've broadened our work to include obesity. And I see some of our uh, partners on here. So thank you guys for what you do. Um, it's really important to note that there are three conditions that lead, or three behaviors that lead to poor conditions that are causing 64% of our chronic disease deaths. And those three behaviors are sedentary lifestyle, tobacco use, and poor nutrition, leading to heart disease, cancer, um, you know, diabetes, things like that, that are taking years from our uh, parents and adults 
earning years and also making it difficult for our kiddos. So it's important that we're having this conversation today. Um, it's also important to note that behavior is the most effective way to make health change. But I would argue it is also one of the hardest. Um, you know, trying to help someone make healthier choices or when we talk about addiction, we know that that's not, it's not enough to just say, please stop and here are resources. That this is a larger conversation that needs support in all sectors. And so we really focus on creating an environment where those healthy choices are easy and supported. We do that with tobacco through smoke-free policies, um, through uh, working with retailers to make sure that they understand the laws on the books. And also we do that with obesity to ensure that kiddos have fresh drinking water in their school days or um, the opportunity for physical activity, whether that's in the classroom or in their community. So there are all ways that we, as advocates, as folks who care about our communities can support health. And that's also by modeling that behavior. Um, you know, like you said, Ob Oklahoma is the eighth highest for youth obesity. And this is information um, that our State Department of Health uh, works with the CDC to collect. They do a survey um, and this is the most recent data available. You can see that that trend line has held mostly steady but we know that early reports um, that over the pandemic, you know, data shows that kiddos experienced weight gain probably like the rest of us, right? Um, so they had limited access to physical activity. Those who might may rely on school lunches had um, decreased quality in food or um, food insecurity. And so it's appropriate that we're talking about this this year. That's about 30,000 high school students. That's the measurement that we have. I know there are others that are seeking to um, get that elementary level measurement of health. I've seen some of those faces on here today. I think that is essential if we're gonna tackle this issue. We need to understand um, the behaviors of our eight-year-olds, you know, or even younger, because um, I, I'm sure many of you, I have a new teenager. If you've ever tried to tell a teenager what to do, uh, you're probably not very persuasive. So it is important that we are um, helping our youngest students have those healthy choices, but you can see here by um, demographics kind of where we are seeing that um, obesity, uh, what sorts of ethnicity have higher rates than others. And that's all really important information as we talk about how do we tackle this together. Um, I wanted to highlight a few uh, signs of progress in this area and then I'll kind of get out of the way so that Trey can, can talk and we'll go back and forth. Um, but TSET has launched, launched its Healthy Youth Initiative. If you've not heard of it, please check it out, the TSET Healthy Youth Initiative. Um, that includes a three-phase program. Um, the first phase is an ad campaign that you may have seen behind the haze. It's talking about, you know, kind of the things that we don't know about vapor products and flavored tobacco, um, making sure that those messages are relevant to teenagers so that they are empowered to make decisions. We know peers are very influential and it's important that we are educating and creating the social norm that not everyone is using tobacco. Not everyone is using a vapor product. It's also worth highlighting that um, this past legislative session, lawmakers passed and Governor Stitt signed Senate Bill 89, which created the Oklahoma Health Education Act. Many of you familiar faces, you know we've been talking about this for a very long time. Oklahoma is uh, one of a handful of states that did not have health education in place. And those standards are being proposed this next year. So if you have something on your advocacy radar, you might add that in there just to make sure um, that good quality standards are moving through the process. And then they are set for implementation in the 23-24 um, school year. The State Department of Ed has worked up some quality standards looking at the CDC whole school, whole child model and others um, to really put forth a robust set of standards. We've also seen an increase in um, child care center participation in the Certified Healthy Oklahoma program. It's a voluntary program, but it does give guidelines as to, you know, how do you um, ensure that kiddos are getting appropriate physical activity, healthy foods, healthy drinks. It's important that kids have access to water. 
Um, and we've also, over the last year, with this um, pandemic funding, seen additional dollars for um, school meals, for social emotional learning, and um, all of those things support healthy brain development, healthy emotional development. And we know, as you guys are probably very aware, with adverse childhood experiences, you will see a higher rate of obesity and other issues. So it's important that children are given the tools to make those choices. But as advocates, we know that kids don't do it alone. The adults on here also have to be um, on board and supportive of that. So I'm, I'm really excited to have this opportunity to talk to you guys today. And then a few things, and then I'll uh, hand it over to Trey, a few challenges that we are seeing. And we know um, that families and children are experiencing increased screen time during the pandemic, online school, online work, um, that I'm sure did not afford children the opportunity to get out and have the rich physical activity throughout their day, disrupted sleep patterns. Sleep is essential to regulating hunger, emotion, um, and helping to have the body run well um, in reducing obesity. Also decreased access to school meals, food insecurity is related to obesity and it's important that we talk about that. Increased household stress, lacked health routines, and then of course, for our primary care providers, we know that we did not, as adults, all get in for our preventative um, screenings as well. So we know that those robust conversations with healthcare providers may not have been happening um, during that time that we were all um, sheltering in place. So I will stop my screen share and I know Trey has some things that he wants to talk about. Julie, I just want to point out two of those things right there. The top two, they go hand in hand because I've read a lot about the uh, screen time immediately before bed, how it can disrupt your sleep patterns. In fact, uh, I purchased some blue light reading glasses for when I read at night for some of the things that I do need to read right before I go to bed. But I also know that Sometimes social media can increase anxiety and that certainly will disrupt sleep. So especially for parents when their kids are going to bed, reducing that screen time, making sure that they're not in there reading their phones or their tablets or whatever it is right before bedtime is probably key. Yeah, and I, you will find resources on our Shape Your Future website about the amount of sleep that kids need. Um, and that's really like the process of, you know, I had a psychologist tell me it's like defragging the brain. That good sleep is kind of working through those emotions and stress through the day and it's going to help you be refreshed whether you're a child or an adult, but it is challenging. Let me get my screen and I know Trey has um, some things that he'd like to talk about. Mr. Ray Hill. It's good Hello to see you there. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. All right. Well, first, thanks for uh, having me on the panel today, Joe. I'm, I'm happy to, to be here talking to this group. Um, and I think Julie did a really good job of covering some of the, the efforts in flight over at TSET. Um, I, I'm sure there, is pro there are probably a number of those programs that uh, the group today was aware of and maybe some um, data points or some programs that you're probably learning about or hearing about for the first time. So um, I, I will first echo what Joe said earlier that this, this topic around the Healthy Kids Coalition has not really uh, been launched in prime time um, yet. So you guys are kind of getting a sneak peek. Um, so, so I think what we envision as this work moves forward is that we'll have an opportunity for um, the governor and probably the lieutenant governor to do some type of joint kind of um, presser on who's involved in this work and how it's moving forward and how um, uh, how it's it's being stood up kind of, I believe, is the fir first of its kind to um, bring what we've talked about here today um, together as, as, as kind of a concerted effort across many agencies and many different um, cabinets. So um, I'm just going to pull up something uh, right fast just so you have a, a little visual, but um, I, I was just going to do an overview of the Healthy Kids Coalition and kind of what's been uh, what's been going on and kind of the focus of this work. And then since we are early on and the committees aren't set, you know, we could talk about next steps. And, and then Julie and I can, I guess, ping pong um, back and forth. I think she, she has good examples um, of, of, 
what we found in our inventory efforts of what's going on out there that just maybe needs to be expanded upon or shared so that more people can participate. But um, I will attempt to share this right fast. Let's see, can you see the Word document that my mouse is swirling around here? Yes, sir. Okay, so this is the only thing I'm going to share since, um, as I mentioned, we're, we're still early on, and, and this is a sneak peek, so don't tell anyone that you heard about this yet. But, uh, but the Healthy Kids Coalition essentially is, um, it's, it's led by the lieutenant governor, um, and it is basically a, um, I guess you could say, conglomerate of different child health initiatives. We hope that it will be um, the one place for roll-up of all related uh, community efforts being made to make a positive impact on children's health. And so what we did as, as pre precursory work to set this up is um, we had set, at least in the health cabinet um, that Julie and I are both a part of, the health and mental health cabinet, we, we had a cabinet goal set to reduce childhood obesity. Um, and there were some spinoff goals set as a result of that. Um, I believe that the education uh, cabinet, the agriculture cabinet, um, I think even the transportation cabinet all had goals set for this past year that were going to touch on moving the needle with um, some health measure, some child health measure. Um, so it, it seemed like a good time to try and create something that would be sustainable, that uh, people could work together kind of across the lines and, and find some common ground to uh, have a better shot at collectively moving the needle. So how that came to be was, I'll just give an example of one of the ones we created here at the Healthcare Authority. We, we started a childhood obesity work group and we invited um, the state agencies that we felt had a, a role to play in, in that work. We, we interacted with several of our agency partners kind of in other areas to say, hey, who do you work with in this obesity space? Who's who's doing something to move the needle with reducing childhood obesity or securing grant funding or putting resources in schools or community health departments? Um, what, what are all the ways we could kind of bring people around the table to, to chart basically a roadmap for improving child health? And uh, that caught some attention. We had, we had done some research and we found that data was not easy to find in a way that was consistent. You know, some of what Julie um, highlighted in, in her slides, uh, there's a lot of work that goes into pulling that data together because it's not in just an easy to pull down click of a button kind of place. And so um, finding accurate data on what we see our kids faced with across the state is, is, is one of the challenges that was recognized in the, in the beginning. But um, anyways, we, we started this group, we formed some committees, we talked about, you know, what would be on our, our goal, what would be on our roadmap as far as goals for the first year. Um, the data moves kind of slow and having access to data, as I mentioned, is a challenge. So we first thought it would be appropriate to set some intermediate goals, some process measures to say, if we could just get everyone working in this direction or that direction with regards to childhood obesity, we'll be, we'll be going in the right direction. And then pretty soon after launching that work, the Lieutenant Governor launched this Healthy Kids Coalition and, and we decided to partner with him and uh, kind of kill more, more birds with fewer stones. So I'm, I've pulled up this template here that uh, is what's come out of that work thus far. And this vision statement is what several of the individuals, including obviously you, Joe, you've been at the meetings, um, a number of other um, private and public entities represented in that group just to just to kind of voice hey here's what we see from our side that needs to be on needs to be a part of the plan moving forward um, that that we did a we did an innovation roundtable and we facilitated some meetings basically to pull information out of those experts that were in the room um, and some of the questions that we're moving forward to answer from this point and is to is to basically download from them and those individuals working in their organizations what are the the best measures of success what are the, the activities that we could engage in to really move the needle and and so that's what kind of led to creating the document you're seeing here um, the team worked together to cast this vision and to come up with the committees they felt would be um, necessary to move this work forward so you can see here i won't read all this to you but the vision statement at least is for all children to have 
equitable access to resources, an understanding of healthy lifestyle choices, and environment supportive of all aspects of health. That's kind of a, a cleaned up version of, of the ideas that we had come in through that facilitated session. And that and, and a lot of, as you might imagine, a lot of the individuals that participated were saying, saying the same thing. So um, it was pretty easy to kind of pull that together and, and cover a lot of ground. Um, and then the committees that were suggested, you can see these five committees here and kind of what the initial um, what the initial thought was on where those committees would focus. Um, so this is kind of in the stage, I would say, of being blessed and communicated so that we would have um, cabinet ownership in each of these areas and we would have agency participation where um, there is some accountability for moving these programs and efforts forward. Um, so this is obviously very high level. Um, it was intended to be so that as the committees were formed um, that say uh, the education one here at the bottom, obviously that's gonna be owned by the uh, Department of Education. So that, that cabinet would essentially assign an owner and they would create a, a team to do this committee's work. Um, there would be a lot of, there will be a lot of interconnectedness kind of between the committees in terms of data sharing and roll up and progress reporting against goals. So we'll have kind of a, a consistent uh, format, which is why this is called a performance template. But um, where we are today is, is uh, we're in the process of interacting with the cabinet secretaries and choosing who's gonna lead each committee. And then as we come back together, and I think you know this, Joe and Julie, but for others, when we come back together, we'll have um, a sense of what goals are already set in those areas that would contribute to this work overall and what goals might need to be set. You know, and, and not every cabinet, we, as I mentioned in the health and mental health cabinet, we already had goals set around reducing childhood obesity. So it was kind of a natural fit for us, but there may be something within the DHS space or something um, like what you and I have discussed one-on-one, -on -one, Joe, in the policy space that could be complementary to the other work that needs to get done here. And so um, we, we wrote a right, white paper, we pulled together an inventory of resources that are um, available in Oklahoma. We've looked at um, interventions working here and nationally, and we're trying to pull together the data in a way that can be informative to these groups as they move forward. Um, and so anyways, I know this is pretty high level um, at this point, uh, Julie's programs are going to provide ob obviously a little more of the detail of kind of what's in flight. Um, but I just wanted to at least introduce this concept to the group. I see some familiar faces on the call. Um, one that's on my on my screen right now is Joel from the from the Cooper Institute. I've met with Joel um, on this as well about just being a, a, a partner to this work and, and, and having an opportunity to help us kind of collectively move the needle. That's what this work is all about. So if it's important to health and human services and um, and the legislature and the governor and the lieutenant governor and the Department of Education, the Department of Agriculture, we're we're thinking that we're going to have a lot better chance at setting up something that's sustainable, um, that uh, your goals are our goals, and we're working together to focus on just a few things at a time and really start moving the needle where the uh, where the data that Julie had up previously um, suggests that we're where we need to focus first. So that's that's kind of the 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 focus and the work thus far. Um, I think there will be more uh, information coming. I think we'll have one more meeting before the end of the year, and then there will probably be some formal launch. Um, those that are interested in participating in this, we obviously have some ways of plugging people into the work. We think every agency um, and, and perhaps every private organization that wants to have a, a, a fingerprint on this or has something to contribute, we'll probably pool communication staff from each of those entities to create you know, the communications and promotion kind of side of this um, so that it is something that you see consistently branded and and uh, pushed out for, for awareness and uh, uh, for an awareness campaign, if, if nothing else. But so that's what's going on in that space. I'm happy to answer questions or, uh, or talk back and forth with Julie about kind of where this, this goes from here. But I think that's kind of the basics, Joe, of uh, the work thus far and kind of where we're headed. Thank you, Trey. And thank you, Julie. Uh, we knew you both would have the, the perfect uh, touch uh, on this, on what we need to do. And you touched on one of the bills, uh, Representative Sterling last filed House Bill 2381, that would require school districts to conduct an annual fitness assessment for students in grades three through 12 
uh, within a course that satisfies PE program in our state. And that's one of OICA's top priorities of what we want to see these schools get back to that opportunity to have some type of PE class to get these kids outside. We know the importance of uh, what we're seeing through what was passed in the legislation with the play-based learning bill last session, but we need to take it up a step and make sure that kids of all ages have that opportunity to get out, clear their mind, get some fresh air, uh, get the heart rate going a little bit. And so we appreciate the Cooper Institute and what they've been working on with this bill with Representative Sterling. And we certainly want to push that forward. If anyone has any questions, please type them over here in the chat section uh, for our speakers at any time, um, and I'll be happy to answer them. I want to start off, I uh, want to say thank you to Lieutenant Governor Matt Pinnell for taking leadership on this issue. Uh, it's been a pleasure to work with him through this committee and help discuss some of these problems and then working with the different state agencies, the healthcare authority, the health department, state department of education, DHS, mental health and substance abuse, all of them have been at the table together talking about what we need to do to improve all aspects of health of kids and get kids more active. And Trey, I know you've been pretty much the spearhead putting all those cogs together and TSET has been in this arena for a long time. We appreciate Julie and their team for doing this. What can our advocates do uh, other than paying attention to this, uh, some of them getting engaged with the coalition once it really starts going forward? Um, what can our advocates do to focus on this going forward and make sure each of their mission has at least in some way touches on this? Uh, I can take a first swing at that. And then Julie's probably got um, some ideas on, on um, a different level of engagement, but I would say for the, for the healthy kids coalition work, um, as I mentioned, you know, there's, there's, I think still some work to be done within these committees when it comes to kind of forming who's got the ball and who's going to be accountable for what goals that are set. Um, so I, I believe once we're at a point where this launches publicly, there would be an opportunity um, not only for people to kind of raise their hand and say, hey, we do what you're looking to do there, or, or we would like to be involved in that, and, and, and can we participate? Because as you know, um, many hands make the, the, the work much easier, and I think if people are kind of rowing in the same direction, and it's a specific enough direction that's been identified through, through um, this type of collaborative work, I think that there's a lot of opportunity there just to have people on board and bringing resources and their network and, and um, what else they may have to offer to the different committees, I think would be really helpful once it's up and running. But I would say at this point, um, maybe just having another opportunity to speak to this group, Joe, and bring updates and say, hey, here's where we are. We have launched. Here's who the point persons are for each committee. Here's kind of the, the goals that are set because we, we meant, you know, I, I think I mentioned it we intentionally left it somewhat vague because we think that the best work, the best goals set for these areas are going to be set by those a little closer to the work. And so we want this to be one concerted effort, but whether it goes into smoking and teen pregnancy and high school graduation rates in year one or some other, you know, subset of measures um, we're still pulling together data to figure out what are the interconnected nature of all, what's the interconnected nature between the, the measures that we really need to move to Im improve um, and increase Oklahoma's health ranking. And so um, there's work, I think, to be done in that space. And then once we launch, I think we'll be able to say we need help here, here and here. But um, aside from, you know, paying attention to the launch and raising your hand to get involved, I think it would just be good to commit to getting back in front of this group or continuing to partner with OICA, Joe, just to make sure that this, this group has um, a hand in shaping the legislative agenda and making sure that what we determine across these different cabinets as being our top, you know, three goals for the first year is reflected in the policy position because we know that there is going to be a large policy component to um, getting this work done. And I think that goes back to everyone kind of working in the same direction. So, um, so yeah, I, I definitely would like to um, continue the conversation here. Um, and, and we'll, we'll commit to making information available once we're at that point. So anyone who wants to get involved can. Fantastic. Julie. Yeah, well, um, I think it's really important to remind this group, the progress that 
Fit Kids Coalition has made over what, probably the last 15 years. Um, you know, you all worked hard to get vending machines not on during the school day so that kiddos, I mean, frankly, I have young children and they see Cheetos and Sprite, like that's what they should eat at all times, at all hours. So we know, and you guys that do the brain development, that kiddos don't have that impulse control. We know that they are being marketed to. Um, we know that there's some tension around um, schools need funding. Um, and those food marketers provide that, but it's also important for the adults to support and set some boundaries. And so um, the Fit Kids Coalition in the past has been instrumental in getting that done. So when we're standing at the bottom of the mountain, I think it is important to note that there's a lot that has already happened um, and there is forward movement. Um, if I could share my screen, I'll tell you about some resources that are out there right now you know, obesity is a pretty complex issue. Um, it's one of the larger issues that we try to tackle because you can't just say, please don't eat. Like, you know, you can, you can help people not smoke and you can create environments where smoking is not the norm, but food is essential to living. Um, and so it is a different conversation that requires a lot of us to engage in promoting health. And so on our Shape Your Future website, there are downloadable resources, whether that's for your you know, office, your community group, if you're a teacher, there are resources for teachers. That's out there. It is free, shapeyourfutureok.com. There are ideas about how you can you know, get your family moving, healthy food options, um, lots of things out there that you can take action to change the conversation around health. Um, also, um, in that same vein, I know I mentioned this earlier, um, we do have our TSET Healthy Youth Initiative, and um, part of that also includes My Life, My Quit, which is text-based cessation for tobacco, and then it also includes Swap Up, which are um, commercials that you've probably seen. There's a lot of it out on social media right now that is really trying to empower young people to make healthy choices. And it's geared more towards that older age group who are out, they're making their own purchase decisions out with friends. And it is focusing on, you know, um, how you might feel or perform in sports or academics if you have, you know, an unhealthy option versus a healthy option. So it is also trying to reinforce those tools for young people. And um, I'll move this. Oops. One of the other things that we've launched that if you are um, in a school affiliated with a school or a youth group, a place to get active is to help get a um, youth action for health leadership group in your community. Um, this is a new program that launched this uh, school year and you know, school starting up has been um, kind of eventful. I think anybody that's working in education um, you know, knows that there's been, it's been a dynamic situation, but we are looking for youth led um, groups that would help have a voice for health in their community and in their school. And um, we are calling that program YAL. Um, it stands for Youth Action for Health Leadership. And you can see the website there. So we are actively recruiting. Um, it does not have to be affiliated with a school, um, but it is helpful to have that adult sponsor, we you know um, church groups and um, different groups might be able to apply for that. So I would just make sure that that is on your radar. Um, in addition, uh, of course, there are materials that you can get if this is something that um, is applicable to your work and making sure that you can promote these healthy choices. Um, there, there are free options available to reinforce that. And then we have grant programs that are available um, for communities, you can see there, this is through our incentive grant program. And this is really starting the conversation at the local level with your city council um, to say, here are some health promoting policies and um, here are some ways that we could bring grant dollars to our state. Um, we do ask that the projects that are put in place with the grant dollars promote health and are available to the public. And you can see that a lot of communities have taken advantage of that since we started. We also have those same grant programs available for schools. And you know, it is really important and we have always emphasized the need for policy because policy will outlive you know, mayor so-and-so and, -so and uh, superintendent XYZ 
and it will have that sustainable impact that is really going to create the change um, that we are seeking. And so this is another opportunity if you are affiliated with schools. All of this information is available on our website, tset.ok.gov. Um, and then finally, um, we do have our TSET Healthy Living Program. And this year is a little different than previous years if you have um, been affiliated with them in the past. Looking at the blue counties, those that are currently funded, they've spent the last year gathering data in their local communities, talking to stakeholders, and identifying priority areas. And some of that has included healthy food options, um, built environment. And so if you see your community there, you know, plug in and see how you can help because they are always looking for champions and they are always looking for people who can help make those connections that can really make a difference because you know, childhood obesity is really um, something that adults have to tackle. Uh, children obviously can be um, given the information to make choices, but if those choices are not reinforced or if the options are very limited in their environment, we're not setting up our kids to succeed. And so it will take all of these partners. And that's why I'm so excited about this multidisciplinary approach um, that the governor and lieutenant governor and Trey are spearheading because we know that it is not enough to just tell children, uh, this is what you should do. They're looking to us and our communities and our schools um, should mirror the future that we want to see. So I don't know if you guys have any questions. Didn't see We've got a couple minutes left. If anyone has questions, uh, type them in the chat. Uh, now, speak now or hold your peace until the next fall forum. Yeah, Joe, just want to mention one thing that Julie touched on, which I thought was really, um, really great to mention that it was recognized at the very, very first um, meeting, actually prior to the first meeting, at the onset of the Healthy Kids Coalition work that the Fit Kids Coalition had already made a lot of progress in this space. And I know that the Lieutenant Governor spoke to that at our first meeting, which I know you were there, Joe. Um, so for those that were involved in that and, and you know, remember and, and are, are, are um, proud of the work that was accomplished, like Julie spoke to, um, I, I remember the, the Lieutenant Governor saying, this is a continuation of really great work that's been in place for a long time. And, and we know from that work where there are some gaps in terms of having the data that we want to see and having some of the wraparound services like Julie was just speaking to for parents and things like that, that uh, it's not, it, you know, it doesn't necessarily drive success only to focus on kiddos or only to focus on schools or only to focus on policy that um, a lot of those efforts are made every day. So uh, certainly wanted to at least highlight that. And um, we know that this isn't a completely novel idea, but I don't want to be misconstrued on the, this is the first ever multi-cabinet uh, offering in this space. I, I think we, we see it as a continuation of that work and kind of an enhancement of it in terms of what data uh, we need to have in place to, to know where we go next. So thanks, Julie, for mentioning that. I would also put in a quick plug. Um, our partners at the State Department of Health are kicking off um, their efforts to do a statewide obesity plan across all ages, um, and those stakeholder groups may be convening, and we hope to see some activity over the next year on that. So all age groups, um, lots of different people, but um, it, is, it is definitely exciting to see a lot of momentum around this issue. Well, well, thank you both for mentioning Fit Kids Coalition. I know, Julie, you had an extra special tie to that. I mean, you were one of the leaders in that back when y'all were beating me up as a legislator to vote for those bills. I hope I wasn't too hard to convince. I think I voted for all of those. Yeah. Uh, Carolyn McAllister just asked, will there be any early childhood initiatives in the Healthy Kids Coalition? I know the answer is yes, but turn that up, Trey. Uh, do you want to touch on that? Um, yeah, so I, I'll ask if, if there's a specific um, early childhood initiative that you're referring to, I, I wouldn't know yet. Um, but if you're if you just mean initiatives that target children prior to school age, I think that's what you mean by early childhood initiatives. And yeah, this this is really meant to actually start with um, uh, pregnant mothers. 
great. So. Yeah, I did. There was, you know, Oklahoma was just um, a superstar back in the 90s and early 2000 with home visitation and several of our early childhood programs, which have all disappeared. I represent Payne County, and we just got our C1 nurse, one nurse back. And that's a very limited home visitation program. And there's just you know, just very limited resources. And we just did a survey of our parents and we were doing great in all the areas except parent support. So yeah. we got to do something about home visitation, like parents as teachers, super expensive, but really effective. And there's so few of those in Oklahoma now where there used to be one, you know, in every county or at least uh, any county of, of any community of any size. So I would really urge that prevention. That's health. So sure. Yeah, but I, I applaud what you're doing. I think it's amazing. Uh, I just I gotta always stick in there for the little guys. So yeah, no, I, I I'm very appreciative for that point. I can tell you that, and, and you know, not to keep going back to the data piece, but I think we we see that, um, you know, we need to be evidence based in driving programs that are going to make the biggest impact. And I think what that suggests is exactly what you're talking about here. Um, do parents have the right knowledge? Do they know what Julie said about screen time? You know, um, are there some of those really, really well pronounced in the data um, lessons and are they communicated? Are those educational resources available? Um, so I think to your point, um, we don't, we don't want to see any gaps if we can help it in this push for child health. And the reason it starts with pregnant moms is there is something there are not something, there are several things obviously that, um, that would, would help someone bringing a child into this world, whether it's their first child or, or, or not their first child, um, those behaviors that they may not know, you know, most moms know they probably shouldn't smoke while they're pregnant, but they don't know half probably of what they'll find out, you know, when their kids are in preschool from another mom or a teacher or another, uh, parent talking about, um, uh, some of some of what needs to be focused on at, a, at an early age. So yeah, we recognize that, um, and this just comes from my point of view and in, in the work we were doing with childhood obesity. Um, I work at the Oklahoma Healthcare Authority, and so we cover pregnant moms and uh, uh, pregnant women. And so um, there is a lot of member education that goes out to someone prior to having a child that's focused on child health. And so. Is there, is there enough of a wraparound service to think of it as kind of a virtual pamphlet that someone would receive so they'd know what to do before that baby's ever born is kind of the, the start of the work. And hopefully it goes all the way till um, in terms of focus within the committees uh, until they're having kids of their own. Right. And you know, another thing we learned on our survey, because you're absolutely right, they are hearing, they don't know where to hear the best information. And what yeah, we exactly. learned is only 40% of them considered their pediatrician as their source for health yeah. information yeah it was dr google you know yeah yeah and, <laughs> and well and, Betty, and i'm like oh my goodness yeah yeah so, yeah that's the way of the world today you know you see yeah. good information you don't know if you can trust it you know and things change so Amen. much you know don't let your baby sleep with a blanket don't let your sleep, baby sleep with, on its tummy and so yeah things i think change really really fast and that's why having a a, a group you know that is it's already a part, our, our hope for the Healthy Kids Coalition is that we're tapping into resources that it's already part of their job to stay on the cutting edge of this. And if it's not, that we need to make resources available to be um, to be partnering with these committees so that we're staying out in front of what people are hearing and um, what, what questions people might have that find themselves in these situations. So that's what I mean by uh, wraparound services. And, and I, I wish that we were more formally launched than we are because I could tell you, yes, Carolyn, it's this person and here's where he or she works. And you know you can, you can make sure that your programming ideas are kind of on their radar. We're just not quite there yet. But, but the idea and what was discussed in our, in our team meetings thus far has been, it's got to go from before the baby gets here because uh, there's a lot that can be done that maybe we wouldn't be out in front of if we're, if we're doing it kind of as a cause and effect thing. Thank I've you. Got to be the bad guy and interrupt. We're five minutes over. So if you got, if you both want to do your closing remarks, and if you would, uh, in the chat, put uh, your websites and if there is a way for people to reach out with further contact. And if you can stick around answering the questions, might be in the chat. Uh, we need to go on to the next workshop, but uh, we'll let y'all have a couple of closing remarks if you have anything else to add. Ladies well, first. I would, yeah, I would just thank this group for your continued. Um, 
emphasis on health. Uh, we know that health and um, the ability to have a job, hold a job and raise a healthy family and make the most of a child's potential is huge. And so um, I applaud OICA for your ongoing emphasis and interest in this. And I will put in the chat the websites where you can find some of these resources. I would encourage any of you who have, you know, any kind of interaction with kiddos to check those websites out. There are free resources there. If you have a place where families come and gather or a classroom, there are options there. And then at the local level, you know, we need to let the folks that are making policy understand that this is vital and important to us and it is important to the future and the economy of our state. So thank you all very much and thank you, Joe. Yeah, uh, closing comment would just be thanks. I'd echo what Julie said about having an opportunity to get in front of this group. Um, I see a couple of questions coming in. So I think what we'll do is um, we'll make sure that once this is launched, we get back in front of this group, Joe, with you and and uh, send information out so that if there are individuals that want to participate in specific committees and they've got some uh, agenda items that they, they wanna make sure are considered that we, that we plug them in appropriately. So we'll commit to doing that, um, but thank you for having us and, and for the conversation. Absolutely, and uh, I'll remind everybody, we do a monthly child advocacy chat at lunchtime on the first Monday of the month, unless that's a holiday. And we intend to have several of these speakers back on throughout the year in 2022 and talk about issues. And we know this is definitely going to be one of those top issues working in conjunction with the Healthy Kids Coalition. So we appreciate both of you for the tremendous work that you're doing. Uh, send our best to uh, Secretary Corbett. I know he was tied up in meetings today and you drew the short straw to come in and talk. So Trey, we appreciate that. Yeah, that's fine. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. And Julie, it's always great to see you back in OICA in some form or fashion. All right, we're gonna kick off to the next uh, uh, discussion with workshop two for children's mental health. Uh, we have three fantastic leaders in this arena and OICA uh, uh, through some uh, circumstances that tied around some, uh, some individuals who are working really hard in this area, uh, our board president has stated that we're going to be very involved in children's mental health issues. And we have some tremendous allies out there working in this field. And we've got three of them that are uh, going to be on this panel. Uh, we're pleased to welcome Dr. Rebecca Hubbard, PhD with the Oklahoma State University Center of Health Sciences. Dr. Laura Shamblin, MD who runs traumainformedmd.com and has been very active in state policy in recent years, as well as being active with OICA. And Shamika Williams, who is the Director of Children's Services for the Oklahoma State Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services, uh, one of our fantastic state agency allies. Wanna turn it over to the three of you. Uh, and I know y'all have already got everything worked out since you've talked in advance. So I'm just going to turn it over to you ladies and let's hear some great things. Hi, everyone. I'm glad to be here with you all today. I just um, am going to introduce myself a little bit and give Laura and, and um, Shamika, <laughs> they totally love my brain, Shamika. Shamika <laughs> introduced themselves. And then we're just gonna talk a little bit on um, youth mental health in Oklahoma, kind of where we've been, where we're at and where we'd like to go. What are, what are some of the successes? What are barriers that we've hit, but overcome? And what are some solutions moving forward? Um, and then there's a little bit of federal level information I'd like to share with you today. So as mentioned, I'm with Oklahoma State University Center for Health Sciences. I am a research scientist and adjunct assistant clinical professor. There, um, I'll be talking a little bit about a program we're building out there in conjunction with Oklahoma Department of Mental Health and many other collaborators, but they are um, they were our grant award winner to help us um, start this in the state of Oklahoma, and I'll get to that a little bit later, as well as a couple of other nonprofit type efforts that I'm involved in, and I'm just really happy to be here. I've worn just about every hat you can imagine when it comes to being related to mental health um, in the state of Oklahoma and, and nationally. So, uh, Lori, you wanna go next? Hi, I am Laura Shamblin. Nice to be here with you all today, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I am, I've been a pediatrician in Oklahoma City since about 2008, 
Um, I have four kids and one of which has had some uh, need of behavioral health services. And um, currently I'm doing a fellowship at OU Child Study Center in developmental behavioral pediatrics. My personal interest has been um, the effects of early childhood experiences on kids and mental health and kind of the lack of training and education that I had as a pediatrician about that 15 years ago and would really like to see improvements in that in our training. Um, let's see. Uh, the last couple of years I served on the board of directors of the Oklahoma Health Care Authority. Um, and in that role, I tried to do a lot of observing and questioning and figuring out what's going on um, in our state and with policies and how rules affect things and how the legislature affects things. So, and I also currently serve on the board of directors of the Oklahoma chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. So thank you for having me here today. All right, um, I'm Shamika Williams. I'm the Director of Children's Services for the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services, uh, where I oversee our statewide children's behavioral health system. Um, for, um, I've had, first and foremost, uh, I think my most important experiences as a therapeutic foster parent, um, actually raising and supporting young people in my, my home. Um, as the Director of, of Department of Mental Health, I work to develop and build a continuum of care for children's services across the continuum from kids who are from the age of uh, zero to five, the early infant mental health population, uh, kids that are most severely in need, our SED population, as well as our transition and youth. Uh, in addition to that, today you'll hear me talk about some of our crisis services that through our statewide mobile response and stabilization system, in addition to partnering with other child serving agencies to make sure that we have a full continuum of care supporting kids that are in our state custody as well as kids that continue to evolve and go in and out of inpatients and on higher levels of care. Um, I have um, worked on the national side as a consultant for other states as well as served as an adjunct professor here at the University of Oklahoma. So I'm excited to be with you guys today. Thank you. Well, we're excited to have all three of you participate in this conversation. Uh, really just want to talk about some of the issues, especially with the theme of our conference. Uh, there's no I in quarantine. Uh, we've had to work really hard to make sure that children's mental health has been addressed uh, through this virtual world we've been living in. Um, while we know things are opening up a little bit better, there's still the possibility, I won't say the likelihood, that things could take a turn for the worse if we have a variant that uh, could be devastating and debilitating to uh, basically everybody out there. What can we do to ensure that children's mental health is protected in the pandemic and going forward? So, uh, Mr. Dorman, you know, I. I don't necessarily want to be the first person to talk, but I, I have to provide a little bit of information. I think that COVID was definitely hard for, for everyone, uh, specifically uh, children and families who have mental health issues. But I think that one of the things that we as a state of Oklahoma really need to pat ourselves on the back about is that unlike other states, we did have a technology infrastructure in place in order to deploy uh, mental health providers to uh, the field utilizing virtual face-to-face. -face. Um, as a mental health system, uh, we begin to embed technology into some of our provider agencies, utilizing iPads as a way to respond. We had already um, developed plans and strategies around the most in need and making sure that those individuals had iPad technology in order for us to interface with them on an ongoing basis. Saying that, I know that that type of technology does not work for, for all children or all families. And so um, other strategies were deployed within the community, specifically around uh, community service providers and law enforcement specifically. Um, I think that um, as we continue to move forward with um, in this COVID environment, it's really important to really strategize around those where technology does not necessarily, is not the most effective strategy in how we aid uh, those young people and families. But I think that um, what, we, what we saw uh, is our ability to immediately put things in place. Um, I think that what we um, learned 
had a lot to do with the caregivers and the caregivers' capacity uh, to manage the stress and the anxiety from COVID. And so we, we definitely had to respond to parents in a way um, that was above and beyond what we were seeing with some of our young people. Um, and what we know when parents' stress and anxiety is up, then it drives the, and it really has an overall impact of the young people that they are caring for or parent. And so I, I, I think that ongoing, there are efforts underway that will definitely be looking at what we've learned from that and how do we continue to move forward. One of the things that uh, we were involved in, and I say we because I kind of have this little team over here that I, I work with and I, I absolutely adore them and I feel like I take them with me and everything, Children's Mental Health Advocacy and that's the Children's Mental Health Resilience Coalition. And we founded that as a part of the Tulsa Resilience Strategy. It was time to look at children's mental health and resilience in the um, Tulsa Resilience Strategy. Tulsa, for those of you that don't know, was selected as a 100 resilient cities from a global entity that works with cities that have a potential to build out infrastructure to improve resilience within their community. And so we launched that and we, we launched February, uh, in March, everything kind of shut down, but we just kept going. We continued to meet. And actually, I have a few things that I can share, some infographics and websites if I can get share privileges. Um, and we did an infographic. And that, that actually, that Children's Mental Health Resilience Coalition, it was Tulsa-based now. It's moving statewide because this is the beauty of what we are zero funded. We have no dollars, but we leverage who we are and what we bring to the table to help one another. And so we've been able to do that from system to system in the city. And so now in surrounding areas, and now we're looking forward to doing that as a state from community to community. And one of the things that we did, um, thank you for um, sharing, giving me share privileges and I will, one of the things, whoops, that's not the one I wanna pull up. We did was an infographic. We just leveraged the resources we had, and then we sent this out. At the time, I was with Mental Health Association Oklahoma, so they helped us create the infographic, and, um, and then our partners worked across the state, and we had it distributed to the 45,000 families of um, Oklahoma City public school system um, to um, the multi-thousands, I forget, in Tulsa, I should know that, I live here, Tulsa public school system, as well as a union public school system, as well as some of the rural public school systems. And it's just a simple, simple tool to help families um, know how to engage with their kiddos around mental health and helping them to be well, and also to encourage family members to take care of themselves as well. We also did webinars around this where people could come and we could kind of expand upon these concepts and give them additional resources. Um, unfortunately, we don't know the reach of this, but we do know where it went and we do hope that it was supportive of families. We wanted to get out, you know, there was a lot of talk of, oh, it's going to be terrible when they try to go back to school in this amended way. And we wanted to get out of, ahead of that and say, let's not wait for the shoe to drop. Let's just create something and send it out into the, <laughs> into the world and see if it can make a difference. So that's, that's one thing that was done as well as there were many other specific school entities worked on things such as Tulsa Public Schools and their mental wellness teams and Oklahoma City Public Schools and their Embrace Oklahoma, um, Embrace OKC program with their multi-tiered support systems and really supporting not only youth, but the families of the youth and the staff serving the youth, which is, you'll hear me refer a lot to those systems because youth do not live in a vacuum. They live in systems, they live in families, they live in schools, they live in faith-based communities, et cetera. And we need to be supporting those systems so that they can support youth as well. Hi, um, well, I would say what we can do to support kids and families right now, I think, you know, from my perspective, I've been seeing patients along with others for the last year and a half or so um, at the Child Study Center, kids with developmental disabilities and also with mental health disorders. And I've just seen, I've seen a lot of isolation, I think, and I've seen a lot of the parent stress. I think the pandemic, um, as Ms. Williams already said, that, you know, that stress to parents has really been difficult because the parents are supposed to be the buffer for the kids. 
and if the parent is really on the verge of their own, you know, difficulty, um, just handling things and, you know, getting accurate information and, you know, fear of different things and anger about different things, all of that, I've seen kind of a decrease in the ability for parents to be able to be a good buffer for their kids. And I've seen a lot of kids that have been pretty isolated, um, not going to school in person, um, interacting with people only virtually, um, not having peers close to their age that their family was interacting with. Um, so we, you know, it's been a rough, rough year to year and a half. And I know that going back into school now uh, with more kids going in person, I think behavior issues in school is really on the rise. Um, and whatever we can do, uh, the people that I see on the front lines are really teachers and schools um, and then pediatricians and family doctors. Um, they're kind of like the frontline people that hopefully people go to for help um, or they're observing when, when families are kind of on the edge of, you know, is this just normal stress or is this moving into a mental health diagnosis, you know, that needs specific therapy. So those are two areas that I think can really use a lot of support and funding and help and, you know, just planning. Um, I think schools are going to need a lot of help in knowing, knowing how to act to support kids. You know, I love that multi-tiered system of support, um, but, you know, the support that they provide can vary from school to school as far as I know with that system. And so just the more specific and, you know, evidence-based support that we can help schools provide is probably going to be the most helpful and help the classroom teachers um, to have something, something to do when one of those issues comes up. So. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Um, uh, you touched on House Bill 1773, the MTSS bill that Representative Conley ran. We know that's going to provide uh, fantastic information and preparation for teachers uh, to know what they're getting themselves into. And the world has been changing. Uh, my column this week, we touched about some of the, uh, the job losses that we're experiencing here in Oklahoma. Uh, Representative Waldron, uh, Representative Baker, Representative Conley did studies looking at the decline in teachers and finding those individuals willing to go into training for that and enter the classroom. And it's not a new problem. When I was a lawmaker almost a decade ago, I did a study about uh, the same subject and how we didn't have enough students in college studying to be a teacher to fill the gap of what we see with teachers. The pandemic certainly has exacerbated that. And then also we look at what's going on in the nursing situation. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Jean Hasher uh, commented uh, along with Vicki White Rankin in a column recently about how we have almost 200 nurses down in the state of Oklahoma since January. And that's part of the problem of what we're seeing in hospitals. And a large part of that is the mental health and trauma situation with these people not wanting to put their health at risk. And so it even goes beyond kids with their mental health. It's finding those professions that certainly touch in the lives of those children. And I just want to talk about some of the resources. I know uh, Department of Mental Health Substance Abuse Services has some fantastic programs out there for individuals. Shamika, uh, yes, I, I to brag about what the work y'all are doing. <laughs> well, I, I definitely want to brag, and you know, but the, but then also say that um, do we have the answer to everything? I think the answer to that is no. But I think it's important for people to know what resources currently exist. Speaking to the the what Dr. Laura said around school based services, we do have some school based services in place. We had to diversify our services for, for teachers. What we started seeing is a number of teachers have built up anxiety um, around kids returning to school. So we had to proactively address and approach and create ways where teachers can consult with mental health professionals around their own um, you know, increased anxiety. Um, so diversifying in that way. Another thing that we did is we were fortunate right before the pandemic hit to receive a federal grant that allowed us uh, to respond to schools uh, that had been a previous disaster area here in the state. 
And so as a part of that response, we started looking at mental health practices in school. We utilized NTSS as a way to, to look at that model. But one of some of the significant things that we did be creative, diversifying our approach is I received pictures the other day around therapy dogs. Majority of the kids that are in a school environment are not able to hug, touch the way that they used to. And so some of the schools are um, have pulled in therapy dogs that are now, you know, one of the dogs is getting ready to move forward with his certification. Uh, schools have embedded calm rooms, spaces where kids can, can maintain a level of, um, you know, regaining control. Um, and so schools have diversified um, and, and our providers have really worked with them in order to create these diverse opportunities. Um, in addition to that, uh, we had currently had a mobile response uh, system in place um, where we responded to kids and families who were in crisis. Crisis doesn't necessarily mean uh, suicidal or acute crisis. We respond to kids and families where families do not have the range of resources or support to stabilize the behavior. OK, um, whatever a family identifies as a crisis, then we want to respond to that. And so, again, uh, we had a system in place to do that response and then technology to support that. Um, in addition to that, I think that there was a mention about our Oklahoma City, Oklahoma City Public Schools Partnership, Embrace, um, OKC, uh, again, developing school based models around mental health, um, around supporting kids in the school environment. Um, most of you guys are familiar with the new 988 system that's coming, coming across nationally and what that's going to mean for, for us as a state. I think it's important to, um, to know that. Um, and then also really looking at what it means for older kids. We, we hosted several uh, youth and young adult uh, sessions, virtual, virtual, to really allow young people to tell us what their experiences were and what are some of the areas that we may not have been familiar with, that they are seeing an increase in some of their symptoms um, and begin to strategize and share it uh, with provider agencies around what that, um, what that meant. Um, and so that provider agencies could diversify their approaches when holding sessions through Zoom, uh, Zoom or virtual face-to-face. -face. You know, treatment can be done in multiple different ways and, and it's not just an interaction face-to-face -face talk therapy and that. And so how do you creatively hold, hold groups uh, through these different sessions? So again, I think that uh, some of this is diversifying our approach. Did we see numbers of kids early on before COVID hit that a, a drastic decrease? When the fear was, um, when the COVID fear hit, there was a drastic decrease in inpatient and crisis care that happened across the state. What does that mean and what does that tell us? And so what can we learn from that is really what we're researching now. From our data, when families are um, in a position where you know, these types of fears happen, what were some of the things that they were able to utilize in order to maintain um, safety, in order to maintain and reduce crisis and the need for higher levels of care? And what can we learn from that? But then also now, the aftermath, we're seeing an increase in numbers. We're seeing an increase in kids utilizing emergency rooms and, and hospitals for psychiatric care. And what does that tell us? Um, I think that we are strategizing in the state. Uh, we're looking at children's urgent cares across the state so that urgent care has become this emergency model for families to, to, to seek psychiatric care. Um, of course, with the 988, the expansion of our crisis system statewide, so that, um, again, reducing those gaps for, um, you know, and building out the crisis continuum so that we have levels for those that are having an onset or an increase in symptoms, all the way to, to, to the individuals who have higher level needs for psychiatric mental health care. And so um, I think that you know, diversifying, being creative in our approaches and really looking at what did we learn from this pandemic in order to help us to move forward. Dr. Shamblin, I uh, want you to touch on your website and the work you've been doing also. Okay. Um, well, I, I really, I, I built this website. It's really just educational and um, I put it together in 2019. Um, after my family had, we had adopted a child um, in 2017, 
And through that process, I realized how much I had missed or did not, how much training I did not get in mental health um, as a resident in pediatrics. And, you know, so I know that everybody who went through training anytime before me or with me also did not get really specific mental health training. Um, so I tried to put together all of the resources that I that was helpful to me and just put it all in one place. Um, and, you know, as I was doing that, I saw things for other types of professionals. And so I started uh, putting that all together, too. So it's really just educational. Um, if you want to check it out, that's great. Um, it's meant to be a tool that you if you are looking for a resource and you can't remember the name, that's kind of what I'm the hope was for me. Like as a doctor, if I'm seeing a patient and I think, oh, I know there's a resource for that. I can't remember what it's called, so I don't know how to Google it. And, you know, I'm in a hurry. So it was kind of my way of just putting everything in one place. Um, so that's what that's what that's for. I haven't kept it too up to date lately because I've been really busy um, in a fellowship and research and classes and all kinds of things. But it, it's really just kind of a living a place where resources are put. And when I become aware of them, you know, I add them there or update them. Um, but I don't, it's not like comprehensive. There's a lot more out there. It, it's kind of meant to be just the things that I thought were most helpful so that it's not overwhelming also. Um, so I wanted, I wanted to make sure and bring up a little bit of um, a point of view, I think, in looking at where we are now versus in the past. And I think it might be a little different than a lot of people have because just because of um, my specific circumstances. But basically, I, I was in residency about 15 years ago, between 2005 and 2008. And at that time at Children's Hospital, um, I, I noticed or I knew that we usually had about maybe two to three attempted suicide patients a year, I would say, um, in the hospital there. So usually it was um, an adolescent girl. Usually it was a Tylenol overdose. I'm really not aware of anything else that was admitted there in those three years. And I never took care of any of them because that's how few there were. Um, so this last January to March, I did um, a rotation of kind of following our psychiatrists inpatient at Children's. And I was pretty shocked at the difference in 15 years. So on my rotation there, we rounded on three to four kids a day who were somewhere in the hospital with major psychiatric issues, either suicide attempt or, you know, different levels of psychosis or some sort of, basically they needed to be inpatient and there were no beds in the actual children's inpatient facilities that we have in the state. Um, you know, children's does not have currently an inpatient psychiatric unit. So if you're there, you either sit in the ER, sometimes for multiple days, with the lights on and people walking around for multiple days, um, or you, get, you can get admitted to a regular patient room with what we call a sitter, which is just a person who sits in the room and watches you 24 hours a day um, because of you know, concern for suicide or something like that. We're, you know, it's just not, not an inpatient psychiatric facility. <laughs> And I think this has been happening in hospitals all over the state um, and definitely through the pandemic. Um, I reached out, I'm on a Facebook group with um, female physicians around the state. And this is one of the things that they commented was, you know, ER doctors are just very concerned that they've been holding children in their ERs for multiple days, not able to get them into inpatient beds. And it, sometimes somebody said that, you know, Sometimes they can't get transport, there'll, there'll be a bed and then they can't get transport to the bed. Um, so, and then also I know if you have a diagnosis of something like autism or intellectual disability or sometimes just have had aggressive behaviors that will disqualify you for most of the inpatient beds in the state. Um, so I know we're working on that and the, the legislature um, actually granted about 10, I think it was $10 million in the last legislative session to build an inpatient unit at Children's Hospital, which they're working, you know, plans are in place to work on that. And then after that, they're planning to work 
on an out, more of an outpatient um, and long-term, you know, there, it's a multi-phase um, project. And hopefully that will, that'll be great and it's very needed. It's about 10 years overdue at least. Um, so I'm excited about that. I'm really excited about that. But I do, I'm, I'm concerned that, that that in itself will not be enough inpatient beds for our state for what we're seeing right now. And I'm really concerned about these kids sitting in ERs all over the state and that, you know, the staff having to work with them, them having to be in a place where the lights don't go out 24 hours a day. Um, so I just, it's concerning. And I thought most people would probably not be aware of the difference in what it was like 15 years ago and what it's like now. It's pretty, it's a pretty surprising difference. I was not aware of that. And I had not heard that. That was startling about, uh, just what we're seeing as far as the transports. And we'll point out uh, Senator Roger Thompson, Representative Kevin Wallace, uh, the two appropriations chairs that were two of our lawmakers of the year, primarily for that legislation, uh, trying to get more help in. I know that's gonna be at Children's. Um, we also know this is a statewide problem. And looking at some of the things going on in Tulsa, Dr. Hubbard, uh, what are some of the areas of what you're seeing? Right, very much the same thing that Dr. Shamblin was discussing. We have youth sitting in ERs four or five days. It's not uncommon. And, um, and this is often something that's challenging for families because they don't know what to do. And we're really, you know, creating kind of a position of despair. And that can get very concerning because we know that lack of hope is highly correlated with suicide. And so it is very much of a cascading experience. We also have um, a bit of a gap between community behavioral health services and that kind of revolving ER and patient um, experience. So there's, you know, um, several different states have kind of some step down or, or um, tiered responses in between maybe an intensive outpatient. We do have a couple of intensive outpatient programs like Positive Tomorrows, but their wait, uh, their wait list is extremely long. And um, even, even community behavioral health right now, the wait lists are pretty, pretty substantial. Um, we also have kind of that drop off when kiddos do go in for um, treatment inpatient or residential and they are uh, discharged. We have kind of a, an area where there, there's a bit of a lack of sustained recovery. I'm not quite sure why or how that's happening because I do know we have supports in place. I don't know if it's that families are not engaging or um, we're not connecting. A lot of times where we don't connect the services to the people that need them very well. So communication, I always say communication is key, right? And so I think maybe it's a communication, I'm, I'm not sure. So we kind of have a little bit of, of that. Um, and then we do have some increased suicide ideation and, and rates. In fact, um, I'm hearing that a lot, all the way from counseling students that I teach to, uh, to community partners, um, to pastors <laughs> that are coming to me and saying, I am seeing, you know, a lot of people come in and talk to me about that they're having suicide ideation and our suicide attempts in youth went up significantly um, per Healthy Minds Policy Institute report that just came out. So, you know, there's a lot of concern and a lot of need. And I think the only way we really can um, approach all of it is to really collaborate across all sectors, across all types of providers, and across all systems to meet the need together as a, as a collective. So if you don't mind, I, I would love to, to speak to that. I, I think that um, um, Rebecca is right. Um, in order to for us to pull this off as a state, it's gonna take multiple levels of, of involvement in, in multiple community partners. I mean, I, I believe it takes a village to raise a child, uh, not just specifically a kid uh, in general, but you know, primarily kids with mental health and substance abuse challenges, as well as those with trauma. Um, I'm not familiar with um, waiting lists. I think that um, it has not come to to my awareness that we have waiting lists in the community among our community mental health providers, specifically those that are um, 
CMHCs or CCVACs. Um, and so that would be something new for me. I think that there could be waiting lists or possible waiting lists, as she mentioned, um, again, across the spectrum with other um, providers, specialty providers as well. I know that for the ID and the DD population uh, with co-occurring, uh, it is very uh, tough to find access to care for that population, uh, as well as those who have autism and other special specialized disorders. Um, I think that um, we have to, as a community, uh, become much more involved in understanding of the resources that are available in each of the communities. Uh, the reason why I say that is because what I know for sure, just like physical health issues, um, oftentimes there's an overutilization of emergency room for physical health. Parents wait till kids are in a physical health crisis before they actually seek healthcare services when they can have primary care providers to attend to those services and ongoing scheduled visits and routine physical health checks. Oftentimes families don't, it is very much the same for mental health. And our ability to educate parents about the importance uh, for not just the overall physical health check from the neck down, but an uh, overall physical health check from the neck up and really where to go in order to access um, outpatient um, community, uh, community behavioral health services. I think our ability as a community to really understand the significance and the importance of localized access to treatment services, again, prevents the re-traumatizing of kids um, when they go in and out of, of higher levels of care or they have to visit emergency rooms for resources that can be cared for in the community. You know, what I know as a, um, as a parent, and like I said, I've, I fostered many, many kids. I, I think that there is definitely a challenge. And at the time when you are, your anxiety is high and your kid is, is um, really not behaving in the way that you would want, it is they're very overwhelming. And I think that oftentimes we resort to a, a more restrictive type of environment uh, like inpatient care. And I think sometimes that can become comfortable. And so the utilization of that is, is a normalized thing for some parents. And so really as a part of our approach, really working to one, inform the community is really important. Inform the community about access to, to community resources, but not just the community. Important community like communities like our faith-based community. Uh, as Dr. Uh, as uh, Rebecca mentioned, uh, the importance of educating um, um, specialized populations or specialized areas and communities where these families are are seeking their daily services. You know, I, I like the fact that um, you know we, what we know is on Sunday, majority of our folks are at a church. Why? You know, what is going to be our approach to educating our faith-based communities and how do we do that? Um, I think that we have strategies here at the department that we deploy and have been working really close with our faith-based community. Have we covered in statewide? Again, we need to deploy a plan for that. In, a in addition to that, the places and spaces where kids are, are at majority of the time. Uh, what we know is that kids are in school majority of the time. How do we edu properly educate those schools that are not involved in our school initiatives? How do we educate other members of the community about not just how to access crisis care, but how to access localized care in the community and making sure that that access is easy. And so I, I definitely think that there are some high points to community access and what that needs to look like and how we need to diversify a plan um, in order to do that. Um, and so, um, yes, definitely, uh, we need to look at how the overutilization, overutilization of emergency rooms and higher levels of care are used and really deploy community planning strategy to really help families um, that have kids that are in need. Thank you. And if I can, if I can, if I can follow up with hers before we move on to the next topic, because um, and the, if there is a silver lining to COVID, it is the fact that people are more aware of mental health and they're and, th and that means families are more aware of mental health and teachers and and right everyone and so people are a little more open-minded now they're a little more okay yeah what can we do how can we come together so we really have had this kind of beautiful um coming together you know i kind of see rivers all coming together right into this 
um, estuary, right? And this rich life that is coming from that. And one of the opportunities we had with the Oklahoma Department of Mental Health at, at OSU is to work with them to build out a child psychiatry access program across the state. And we're just starting, we were just awarded a grant to build that out. And we're very excited, but there are many, many ways to utilize and kind of morph that process, that program into connecting with different things. So to explain a little bit, the child psychiatry, which it will be called um, Oklahoma CAP map. It's Oklahoma Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and Mental Health Access Program, because we want to increase and help kids to get access to psychiatrists, but we also want to increase our psychiatry care, but we also want to increase that behavioral health, mental health, because we know that medicine and therapy together with most diagnoses is um, beneficial. And so we, we don't, we don't, we, and we don't want to create silos anymore, right? We want to bring everyone together. And so in that process, we will be having, um, the move is for primary care providers, like has been mentioned here by both um, Laura and Shamika, to be able to handle those baseline questions or those early intervention, you know, screenings and assessments and with a psychiatrist consultation or a licensed mental health professional consultation on that. And so we don't want to make the load heavy. We're going to do our best for primary care providers to keep it very succinct. I'm married to one. I will never hear the end of it if I make their load heavier. So uh, we will keep it streamlined and simple and accessible, right? So that they can get consultation, education, and referrals hope to create a behavioral health network where it's really clear who they can refer to, who is the best connection for that particular child. Um, Cause that's what I hear. The three things I hear are, I don't know who to refer to. If I know some people to refer to, I don't know if they treat this, if they're really highly skilled in this particular diagnosis. And if I know both of those, I don't hear back, which we know HIPAA is kind of one of those hiccups that we all hit, um, but they don't hear back. You know, well, how can we bridge that gap and really create a continuum of care for youth and for their families? Um, because that is the solution is that, you know, really coming together and creating that continuum of care. Different states have had this grant and have start to build it out already for a, a couple of years. Some of them are starting to implement in and build in with schools or with hospitals or what have you. Um, the thing that I love about ours is that we are doing that mental health side so that it will integrate very well with the MTSS. I believe the goal is to have somebody asked in the chat, and I believe the goal is to have an MTSS in every school district across the state. That's, that's the intended goal. So not only will we be able to connect pediatricians and family medicine docs and OBGYNs with psychiatry and licensed mental health professionals, but we'll also be able to connect, you know, teachers and admins and counselors and et cetera at the school level, guidance counselors or, or cafeteria staff, right? Or, you know, all those ancillary staff that kids are connecting with and really building up that training and that experience and that knowledge around mental health, which what does that do? That lower stigma because we're normalizing, addressing mental health, and it increases access to services because it overcomes barriers like stigma, like not knowing where to go, not um, and and not knowing where to even start, maybe and giving it a start point. Fantastic, and we're uh, coming up on the end. Um, I want I want to talk about going forward. Uh, the next uh, next uh, portion of the conference is for advocate feedback sessions. And so this is where we're gonna be shaping our legislative agenda. Uh, we'll go in reverse alphabetical order. So Shamika, I'm, I'm putting you on deck here, uh, or you're up to bat. Um, one of the things uh, Dr. Shamblin's promoted, which I think is a fantastic idea, is to administer the ACEs exam for kids with their pediatric visits. And so you've been talked about giving that to the parents as well to look at that multi-generational issue with trauma. If we have the kids in there, the doctor can uh, administer the ACEs test and see if the kids are experiencing high levels of trauma, but also find out the parents also experience that. What are, what, Shamika, start off with you, what would be a, a wish list of things that our advocates uh, should look at and hopefully promote in the legislative session next year? 
if you're allowed to touch on that from an agency perspective. Yeah, I, so I want to, let me say this. I think it is definitely important to screen uh, youth, young adults, and adults uh, through, through their um, primary care and, and uh, physical health care appointments, just like we do in mental health. I think a screener is definitely, should it be the ACEs? I'm, I'm not going to tackle that, but I think a screener should be embedded in any primary care so that the identification uh, for those who may be experiencing uh, mental health related issues. And so they, my, my thought to that is yes, there needs to be a screening process. Um, second to that, I, I, I want to, um, again, from an advocacy perspective as a parent, um, but then also the director, I think that our ability as a state to, to create, you know, clear processes for um, access points from a primary care physician office to a partnership uh, with a community provider or a partnership through a line where, where we can identify and connect kids. But I think first and foremost, what we have to understand is we cannot continue. We, we, we definitely have gaps in the system where we have a limited number of doctors, we have a limited number of psychiatrists, and we have um, different partnerships who, that are filling the base. I think, but we also have to look at is how we partner with communities across the state. What we know is that kids um, who have adult allies and adult support systems in place are, are, are much more supported. And so uh, again, as you talk about the psychiatric um, uh, partnerships between primary care and the need for these types of screeners, I think that when in fact we have limited resources in some of our rural communities, we need to look at alternative measures and how to use our communities as a way to reduce some of these barriers. And so, um, such as, you know, um, you know, I know schools are embedding screeners as a part of, of their process. Some are using SDQ. And so what are other ways, alternative ways to, to really screen and identify uh, young people uh, could be important. So the quick answer to that is yes, I think screening is amazing. Should it be the one that you're referencing? Um, I, I can't speak to that. <laughs> Dr. Shamlin. Well, I, th I think that what's kind of neat is that California is doing a lot of this already. They've really spearheaded um, this effort to do universal screening, and I'm interested to see what happens with that. I think we'll get some good data and results uh, to find out, you know, was this helpful? Were the doctors properly trained? I mean, currently in our state, I don't, I, don't, I couldn't say that all doctors would even know what to do or what to do with the results or, you know, so I, I, I don't want to push that when people are not prepared. Um, but I, I'm excited to see what happens with California and their universal screening um, efforts, and we'll see what, what data we get from that. Um, I think reimbursement is always an issue. <laughs> um, so in, in every level of mental health care, uh, especially for kids, um, just I, I feel like reimbursement of providers for everything is, is a barrier. And that's something that the legislature could look at maybe because sometimes they can direct when um, reimbursements should be increased. Um, Dr. Hubbard and I were talking yesterday and I think workforce is a big problem. Um, I was just answering someone in the chat, um, but I hadn't sent it yet. Uh, Lori Wathen, I think who's from Sooner Success mentioned, you know, wait lists for things like PCIT and ABA therapy. Um, I, I would say prior to COVID wait lists were like, three in the three to six, maybe nine month range prior to COVID. Post COVID, it's like six months to a year and a half. And for, and I would say that's almost like for every level, if you need a diagnosis of autism, your wait is six months to a year. Then if you need ABA, your wait is another six months to nine months maybe. So just, the problem of early intervention, and that goes for most mental health issues too. Um, if some people are seem to be lucky and they fall into the right, you know, resource, and there's an opening and they get in quick, and that's wonderful. But a lot of people are coming into the 
the barrier of wait lists. And partly that has to be because of lack of providers in those areas. And I think that one of the barriers to providers is lack of reimbursement for these types of um, treatments. It's just not profitable and it's hard to, it's hard to pay overhead. There's not much incentive to like open a new agency in this area because you're not going to make a profit. So that, I don't, that's just one of the major barriers that I see and I, I'm sure others see others. I agree. Dr. Hubbard. Yeah, so I would say three things legislatively and I'm going to share my screen again <clears throat> and show you just a couple of things really quick and I'm happy to share these with you as well. So I am fortunate to get to be on the Tulsa NAMI board and serve with the great people and work with NAMI Oklahoma closely on legislative efforts. And one of the things that just came out was this advocacy alert for needing more mental health professionals and some bills that are coming forward on the federal level um, to support a broader usage of licensure opportunities and opportunities for people to become licensed to provide mental health care um, across the United States and within specific states. Additionally, and hopefully this is changing with me, is another request from the Federal Mental Health um, Reform Act of 2015 is up for kind of a review process. And so this is a advocacy alert to write in. And because a lot of these dollars that come to our state and are distributed to help us do these amazing programs that Shamika mentioned, they've come from federal, so you know, federal funds. So it's really important to write your legislators at the at the national level as well and make sure that they're supporting. Uh, these efforts to continue and, and be maybe even enhanced. Um, I'd also like to share, and hopefully you're probably going to see my insane screen here for a second. Um, 988 is going to be implemented July 1st, 2022. And ODMH is working diligently to, to erect some urgent care, you know, urgent cares and um, response processes, you know, because what will happen is they'll go to a national number, but what they want is for it to roll to um, in-state providers. And of course, as you can imagine, that might be a little tricky across the state of Oklahoma with so much of our population being rural. So being able to really um, figure out a way and work together to bring in this, um, implementation of 988 at the state of Oklahoma and be supportive of ODMH's efforts and see how we can um, continue to, to advocate for support in this arena is going to be vital because mental health crises is um, something that we, we, I mean, we just have, we're just at that place of a lot of suicide ideation going on, a lot of um, mental health challenges going on and that kind of thing. So I just wanted to bring to your attention, you know, the idea, the kind of those three areas is workforce, right? We need to, we've, we're finding a way with this, this okay cap map to kind of overcome some of the shortage in the 72 of 77 counties of shortage of behavioral health providers. Um, and that's one part of it. The, all of these are going to be multiple answers, not just one, right. one silver bullet that's going to take care of it, right? And so, so uh, workforce development, we need advocacy support there. We need advocacy support on mental health crisis response, and we need advocacy. What was my? I don't remember my third one. It was something grand, I'm sure, but we'll call it good. I think Rebecca brings up a, an, a really good point. I mean, this 988 system is going to be um, huge for the state of Oklahoma. And I know the department has been working uh, tirelessly in order to get things worked out and put a plan in place. Um, again, if we have a little time, I'm, I'm more than happy to share the illustration to provide more in-depth information around what, what that means for us as a state system and what are our plans and what it's going to look like. Um, but again, for the sake of time, if we have time, I have a, a slide that I can pull up, but I wanted to give Dr. Laura an opportunity to respond as well. If she Absolutely. We'll have Christine give you a uh, shared access. There is an, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Laura. 
I was just going to say, I thought I responded first on that round, but okay. any questions, go ahead. So can you guys see this? Yes. Okay. So this, this is the Oklahoma Comprehensive Crisis Response Plan is in reference to uh, what Dr. Um, her, uh, Dr. Rebecca, I mean, what Rebecca mentioned <laughs> in reference to 988. And so what's happening now, Oklahoma released an RFP for a statewide uh, call center helpline. Uh, this helpline will work in partnership with 911 as a way to, for anyone in the state of Oklahoma to contact if in fact, that have an individual in crisis or them themselves as in crisis. We're talking about zero to 99, it doesn't matter who you are. Um, as a part of that crisis response, there'll be a line of trained um, experts who will be licensed individuals that will be taking those calls. Uh, those individuals will have the opportunity to, to really de-escalate the call at that particular time and set individuals up for a next day appointment uh, with one of the treatment providers. Uh, if, in fact, that individual uh, is not, I mean, say, for instance, the crisis is so acute and we need to respond immediately, um, we will send out a mobile crisis team that is contracted and operated in the areas closest to the crisis. So whether you're an adult or you're, you're a child, if, in fact, this line identifies that you need immediate assistance. And so, again, immediate assistance means there's not a safety issue. Again, working with our law enforcement for the purpose of deploying and making sure we have more officers trained in CIT, when in fact there's an immediate safety issue is something that we're doing. But in most cases, we're talking about issues that are not gonna be immediate safety, where we can send out a mobile crisis team, uh, not behind the law enforcement officer or in partnership with, but this is where safety is not an issue. We'll send out a mobile crisis team will be deployed for the purpose of addressing and providing a face-to-face -face response. Uh, for that person that is in acute crisis. Uh, in addition to that, like I mentioned, for those where the crisis is not acute enough and the person prefers a next day appointment, we will have real-time scheduling in place to schedule them with the provider uh, in their location or in their community so that they can walk in the very next day and see someone when in fact a mobile team doesn't need to be deployed. Uh, in addition to that, there's a transportation bill that was out that made Department of Mental Health responsible for transportation of individuals outside of the 30 mile radius um, of the location of an inpatient setting. And so what that means is when in fact, um, the location of an inpatient setting and the person needs inpatient care after being assessed by the mobile crisis team, then the actual um, transportation authority, being DMH and our contracted transportation providers will be responsible for transporting that person uh, to that location. And so if it's within the 30 mile radius, and there needs to be a transport. Of course, we will work with our law enforcement officers when in fact they are involved or our mobile team can assist with transportation as well. Um, again, our expectation is that we want to really look at a high diversion rate where we actually get these people into outpatient care immediately, okay? Because again, we can look at long-term stabilization, sustainability of their mental health, whether, whether we're talking about individuals who may need medication to for ongoing um, management or individuals that um, need um, other types of mental health care. Our ultimate goal is to get them in an outpatient setting where we can get them stable. Um, but in addition to that, standing up these urgent care facilities for children and adults across our state is gonna be significant and important because our urgent care is our first line of defense where we have up to 24 hours in order to stabilize the bird, provide medication, provide a plan for diversion of those young people or those adults. Uh, but then also our crisis settings where we have crisis centers across the state uh, that will be available to, to aid these individuals as well as our acute setting and our residential setting. And so again, this is just an example uh, of our crisis continuum that we continue to evolve and build out for the purpose of aiding those individuals in crisis. Um, but ultimately, uh, we have strategies that we're deploying in our communities to better educate our community about mental health resources and what that access um, looks like across the state. And so we will continue with those efforts as we continue to develop our crisis continuum um, uh, in preparation for our 988 uh, launch that's, that's happening nationwide. Thank you. And I want to ask uh, any of the materials you all have, if you will shoot them over to us, we'll send them out at our, uh, our uh, daily wrap-up of the conference. I want to make sure people have access to 
go over this information and we are just a little bit over time and need to get into the next one. I want to thank all three of you. This has been fantastic. We really appreciate you taking the time out to educate us and the attendees about these issues. And as I said, we're next one we're going into is our, our brainstorming session. We're going to end every day on a positive note coming up with ideas. So y'all have given us a lot to think about. So oh, thank you very much. Uh, I know there are some questions over here in the uh, chat section. If y'all could stick around and answer some of those, uh, we're going to do a five minute break. We'll be back here at 1127. Uh, we'll, we'll carry over a little bit for those that can. Uh, we're gonna have one discussion starting off with uh, dental health, and then we will get into the direct discussion about issues. And, for those of you that haven't used Jamboard, uh, Peyton's going to give you a lesson on how to interact. Uh, it's a fantastic way through a conference on Zoom to be able to share ideas. And so with that, uh, let's take about five minutes. I will stick around if you all have questions for us about uh, anything. Uh, Peyton's here too. And we'll have a poll that's going to be coming up in just a couple of minutes uh, that we want you all to answer. But go ahead and take five and we'll see you back here in just a couple of minutes. and don't leave. We've got the important work is about to start. Uh, we want y'all here for this on the brainstorming session. Hi, Joe. Hello, Can you hear me? How are Hi. You? This is Teresa. I just wanted to be sure everything was working before we get out of this break. So can you hear me okay? I can hear you just fine. And we'll give you the screen sharing capability if you need that. Okay, yes, I've just got a couple of slides. Thank you. Thank you for being a part of this. Oh, thanks for having us, we appreciate it. Everyone's being just as quiet as they were at the beginning. I would have thought you'd have had enough coffee by now. I really am going to have to put some uh, Jimmy Buffett music on tomorrow for our breaks. I can hear Christine laughing in the other room. I hope everyone has enjoyed this. Uh, I know it's not an ideal situation to come together on Zoom and do these things, but we just felt it was important. One, we couldn't let Fall Forum get away this year, not when it's so critical to make sure we have a legislative agenda for 2022 but also we still wanted to protect everyone's safety. And with what we've seen recently of breakthrough cases and tragic loss of Colin Powell the other day, Colin Powell, I it just, we still want to play it safe and we want everyone to be as safe as possible. We appreciate those donors that we mentioned earlier uh, for making this possible. Um, I just, I'll run back through those because uh, it's important that we, uh, we give credit where it's due for making this conference possible. Uh, the Schusterman Family Foundation, the Charles and Lynn Schusterman Family Foundation, the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma, the Chickasaw Nation, or the Cherokee Nation, not of Oklahoma, the Chickasaw Nation, uh, PACOM, the Merrick Family Foundation, the Love Meyer Family Foundation, 
Liberty Dental, Delta Dental, the Delta Dental Foundation of Oklahoma, Oklahoma Oral Health uh, Coalition, Oklahoma Complete Health, Oklahoma Caring Foundation, Arnall Family Foundation, T-SET. Uh, Teresa, we appreciate y'all so much uh, for being a part of this and helping out. Um, really looking forward to doing a deep dive into these conversations uh, about what we can do as far as suggesting policy to lawmakers. We moved, originally we'd scheduled fall form to be in November, but with the earlier onset of the deadlines with the legislative session, we wanted to make sure we got these ideas to lawmakers with plenty of time to get legislation drafted should any of these lawmakers choose to pursue these ideas. And we know there will be a lot of them that do want to look at some of these ideas. So um, we appreciate everyone for being a part of this. Um, it's 1127, we're gonna go ahead and kick back. Um, this is not just a, a effort by the OICA staff. We have some phenomenal board members one of those, uh, honestly, I can't believe we drafted into being a part of our board was uh, Senator A.J. Griffin, who retired from the legislature a few years ago, uh, went to work for PACOM, who was an advocate long before she was a lawmaker and continues to be an advocate afterwards. Uh, A.J. is the chair of our advocacy and policy committee that helps draft a legislative agenda. And one of the things that we worked on is creating a scorecard. And I'm gonna bring that up on the screen. I hope everybody can see that. Uh, can everyone see our scorecard? So with this scorecard, this is the cover. Uh, our communications director, Jay Gum, uh, did all the design work. Uh, Peyton Stacy, our policy director, uh, monitored the bills and did the research. And you can see over here, the scores of the bills that we ranked. And you can go onto our website and see what each of these bills did, but it's not always a positive situation. We have bills that we oppose. And three of these we were very adamantly opposed to and worked. And even though they still became law, we're still gonna speak out because we feel that is what's in the best interest of children. And you can see our award key here for a score of 95, the CEO's on a roll, score of 100, the chair's on a roll. We give extra credits. Uh, you have a score of 105, which were the salutatorians, and then we had one valedictorian. And you can see the uh, lawmakers that spilled over the senators here. And then you can go down and see on the other page the uh, scores of the lawmakers. And we appreciate it. And you can see most lawmakers were very high in their scores. Most of the lawmakers will uh, vote in favor of what is in the best interest of children but there are some that need a little extra work and we can't do it alone. That's where we need the advocates. So fall forum's not just about shaping a legislative agenda. It's not just about educating ourselves about the different areas of policy, but it's trying to build up that network to ensure that we go forward into the legislative session and have an army of advocates making a difference. Uh, our fearless leader on that side of it is Senator Griffin. Uh, AJ, did you have anything you wanted to add on? I just want to make sure that everybody kind of understands the process too. When we have bills that come up on the watch list, um, Joe and I don't just decide whether we oppose it or support it. It actually is a committee and we committee during session meets really regularly um, to, uh, to review and to discuss. Um, you know, we have uh, trying to just keep everything 10,000 foot level as well. So that we're, is this good for kids or bad for kids? And that's really the only question that we ask. And so that's why um, bipartisanship is really important in what we do. And um, just thank my com the committee, because um, this is a committee that takes a lot of time during session to go over things. And I um, also want to give a big, huge shout out um, to Peyton, who um, does a fabulous job um, keeping us on track and making sure we have the information we need to dis make decisions during session and all of the rest of the year. Thank you so much. And you're exactly right. This is a team effort. Don't want anyone to think it, that it's just a smoke-filled room. I know Julie especially wouldn't appreciate that. Uh, this is an open and honest process where our board is working and directing the staff and the staff is trying to compile the data 
and get that out to our board as well as some of the advocate organizations we work with like the Potts Family Foundation. We work very closely with them to track legislation and monitor what's going on. And we try to provide bi-weekly update dates to our member organizations during the legislative session. And we put out regularly action alerts for individuals to be engaged in the process. Sometimes advocates don't agree with our stance and we get that. You're never always going to agree on these things, but we try and present an honest dialogue and make sure that people know what's going on so they can have their voice involved and engaged. And so boss, are we ready to go ahead and start kicking off the discussions? I'll take that as a yes. So yep. we are going to start our advocate sessions and we're doing it a little bit different this year. Uh, the first advocate session where we're gonna have feedback is on mental health and physical health. We're trying to keep everything consistent based upon the workshops uh, to pique your curiosity and open up that discussion. Uh, before we get started, uh, one of the areas that we wanted to touch on this year is looking at where we're at for children's dental health and oral health in Oklahoma. Uh, Teresa Singleton with Oklahoma Oral Health Coalition has agreed to uh, share some comments with us starting off, and then we wanna open it up wide uh, on the discussion. As soon as Teresa's done, we're gonna present a polling question, and then Peyton will run through how the Jam Board will work, where we'll collect the ideas and assemble our legislative agenda. So Teresa, I wanna go ahead and turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Joe. Um, I am the current secretary of the Oklahoma Oral Health Coalition. I'm also the director of the Delta Dental of Oklahoma Foundation. Our foundation funds uh, dental health access and education programs across the state. All of our funding goes to the oral health, um, uh, oral health initiatives. Um, I appreciate this opportunity to bring children's oral health to the table because it is such a crucial part of the child's life. And from lost school time to lost self-esteem, uh, poor oral health deeply impacts a child. And unfortunately, children's oral health indicators in the state of Oklahoma are consistently ranking low. So at this time, I'm going to share my screen, if this goes well, and share. I want to share with you, and Joe, can you give me a thumbs up or tell me, can you see my slides? It's great, thank you, AJ. Okay, so this is um, the Oklahoma Oral Health uh, Report Card for 2020, the most recent one. This is a, a document that our foundation and the Oklahoma Oral Health Coalition put together, and it is comparing the uh, Oklahoma, Oklahoma's uh, key indicators of oral health to those of the other states. So basically, if you have a C, you're right on par with national average. Obviously, you have, if you have a D, you're below average, and an F would be significantly below average. Now, there are many, many things you can measure, but these are the particular things that, that the, the states uh, are using to measure children's oral health uh, indication right now. Um, you can see that in far as the children who are enrolled in sooner care, um, overall, but about half of them or less than half of them are receiving a preventive dental visit. And that's really sad because sooner care does a great job of covering comprehensive care for our children. Uh, we also now have the exciting addition of the adult um, benefit for adult dental care that goes beyond uh, extractions as, and that's all it was in the past. But for children, for years, it has been well, uh, it's been a very good comprehensive program. However, to not have every single child in a dental chair at least once a year, if not every six months, like is recommended, um, is really sad. So that's something we've got to work on. Also, only about 10% of children have dental sealants on permanent molars. And this is a proven and a huge way of getting, uh, decreasing, um, uh, cavities because about 90% of the cavities are happening on those back molars and this prevents that. Uh, in the general population, and this includes all children including, including those on senior care and not, 72% uh, of children 1 to 17 had been to the dentist at least once and that's not necessarily a preventive treatment. Unfortunately, sometimes the only time they go is when there's already a problem like a cavity. Uh, but at least one visit, and that is below the national average. 66% of third graders have caries experience, and what that means is they have treated or untreated tooth decay, cavities. 
uh, that is very high compared to the national average. And then 25% of all third graders have dental sealants on their permanent molars, again, much lower than national average. Now, uh, this is a very important thing to note is that good public health policy requires good data. And I wanna tell you real quickly about how we got the data for most of those, um, for especially that information about statewide information on kids. Uh, the National Oral Health Surveillance System is a collaboration of CDC and the Association of State and Territorial Dental Directors, and it monitors oral health, uh, both the disease and the, the use of the, the uh, healthcare system on the national and state level. Uh, this provides incredibly important data for to guide policy decisions. But he, most people don't realize that it's not the CDC that provides the states with this data. It is the states that provide the necessary data to the CDC. And the way Oklahoma does this, and the only way Oklahoma can do this, is through a uh, the third grade assessment, uh, oral health assessment program through the Oklahoma State Department of Health, Dental Sur Health Services Department. Um, the, uh, the oral needs health assessment is a collaboration of OSDH and the OU College of Public Health. It sends dental hygienists to, at, to assess the oral health status of third graders throughout the state of Oklahoma. It uses a scientific study with a, the random sampling. So it's a true study and the kind of research we need and it is statewide. Uh, they look into the prevalence of both the uh, dental caries and also dental sealants among a few other points. And this was conducted every two to three years uh, between 2007 and 2016, giving us some rich and important data. However, it should have been conducted in 2019, but funding was not available then, and it has still not been made about available. So I just wanted to point that out as a, a good uh, place that some legislation or at least some attention can go to, because if, um, Basically, to improve children's oral health, we've got to be able to measure children's oral health. And so ensuring that this is um, uh, funded would be a really good way to start that. I'm going to stop my share now. And um, the other thing I would just mention is uh, just piggybacking on what Dr. Shamblin said about senior care reimbursement rates. Um, same thing in the oral health area. The, we hear that a lot when we're looking at why don't we have more uh, oral or dentists participating in sooner care, or even those who are accepting new patients, and reimbursement rates comes up very frequently. So that's a really big issue, and it's going to be even more of an issue now that the adult dental benefit has been ex expanded, not only to more adults, but actually to a uh, full range of services, including preventive uh, fillings and um, dentures. So it'll be even more of an issue then. Uh, so that is basically a quick overview of children's oral health right now in Oklahoma. And I will put our uh, web addresses in the chat box so that you can go there to find these PDFs and more information on oral health. Fantastic. And thank you, Teresa. We appreciate you providing that. We wanted to make sure that that was a part of the conversation as we're going into this next session. Um, uh, you and I talked about a personal story I'll share. Uh, when I was in, second grade, I fell and broke several of my teeth. And my parents, even though they were dirt poor, spent money at the dentist to make sure that my teeth were okay and that I had the opportunity to have healthy teeth as those baby teeth fell out and the, the adult ones grew in. And a lot of people don't realize that or truly appreciate the need for dental health. And it's not just the pretty smile, it ties in with so much on your health issues. Uh, that's just one example of one of the things that we are the many things we want to talk about as we're going into this. Sarah's uh, going to queue up our uh, first polling question. Uh, we want our advocates uh, to look at this and and we're going to kick this off and 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 want you all to vote on this. Uh, we want you all to look at this as far as which of these topics do you think is the most important policy topic that will impact children. We have mental health, physical health, economic stability child welfare systems, juvenile justice systems, technology access, or all of the above. Uh, these were basically the topics that our advocates and our board and team uh, chose as the issues to discuss at Fall Forum. We know this is a wide 
array and it can go into so many different areas and probably some were left out. But we just want to get your input starting off. Which of you feel these topics uh, are an issue? And we'll leave it open for a few minutes. Yeah, I'm, I'm fascinated. As a former political science major, I, I love data and just love, I love the opportunity to see uh, what you, the experts out there working in the field, what your thoughts are. We've had 26 of you vote. We've got a few of you that are still not casting your vote. We'll close it in just a couple of minutes. We're going to ask several of these polling questions throughout the conversations as we go forward uh, throughout the conference over the next four days. And it's still ticking up a little bit more. Uh, we'll keep it open for about one more minute and then we're going to break into the conversations and We'll have some additional questions and Peyton will go through and explain the Jamboard once we uh, do that. Peyton, will you throw that in the chat again as far as the link for individuals to be able to go to the Jamboard? And we'll, we'll start that up as soon as we finish up with the polling. Absolutely. And if you want to go ahead and just while they're voting, go ahead and explain the process with the Jamboard. Yes. So I will share my screen here in, in a little bit. Um, and walk through this with, with you all. But this year we decided to do polling questions and this is, is one of the, the polling questions. And then in order to facilitate discussion, we um, came up with the idea to use the Jamboard. So each polling question will have a, fol a follow-up question. So, so a Jamboard question. And on the Jamboard, you will, able, you will be able to post your um, answers to the, the questions, your ideas, all, all of that good, good stuff. Um, and Joe will, Joe will be, be able to watch that. And, and um, yeah, it'll, it'll be really great. But I'll be able to show you just um, exactly how you do that here in just a minute. But go ahead and click on that, that link and let me know if you cannot access it. And let's let's go ahead and finish up the polling question. There you go. I'll share the results. Um, I mean, this this is a fascinating response. Uh, it's, I I think it's important that we hear from each other uh, where those ideas should be focused. And while we know all of these are important, uh, some are going to require more attention. And we want the input from the advocates who are assembled to share those ideas. And so uh, we appreciate you responding on this. So now let's go ahead and click over Peyton and let's show everybody how the Jamboard works. Okay. Sarah or Christine, I'm not sure who is able to. Provide you a screen share. And the polling question. Maybe I'm just the one who still has half of that. Yeah, just click out the X at the top and it'll clear out. All right. So we actually have one more polling question before the Jamboard begins. Okay, can all of you see this? Okay, so. Um, the first question is how can, can Oklahoma improve access to quality food and physical ac activity for, for the state's youth? So if you guys click on this little icon, it is a sticky note and this pops up and you will type in your su suggestions and, and answers here. So let's say um, or recess for students K through five, and there it is. And I'll be sure, yep, perfect. So um, Christine or Sarah, again, I'm not sure which one of you are 
doing or is doing the polling questions, but if you will um, please post the next polling question, that would be great. Does okay. Oklahoma need to invest more in quality food and physical activity opportunities? And one, yes, the state needs to invest more. Two, no, it is a local and private issue. Three, no, not at all. Or four, answers one and two combined. And I don't know if we'll, will we need to answer questions one and two together. There are actually eight questions. Um, so we'll, unfortunately, we'll, they're not broken out. So we'll have to answer all of them and submit. And then we can go over the results. Peyton, you, I'll share the results and then you can go over them as, as you get to that section. All right, so with the eight questions, when in the second question, the rate of child suicides has dramatically increased during the pandemic. Which of these topics is the top priority to reduce child suicide rates? One, ending isolation, in-person learning in schools, access to mental health services, child trauma reduction, or all of the above. For question three, how prepared do you feel your community providers are to serve families of children with disabilities? Very prepared, somewhat prepared, neutral, somewhat unprepared, or very unprepared. Question four, please rate how strongly you agree with this statement. Childhood trauma is an issue in my community. Strongly agree, agree, neither agree nor disagree, disagree or st strongly disagree. Question five, please rate how strongly you agree with this statement. I believe the state's improvements to virtual mental health services have been a success. Strongly agree, agree, neither agree nor disagree, disagree, strongly disagree. Question six, are you familiar with the OSDH, Oklahoma State Department of Health's oral health needs assessment? I am very familiar with the assessment. I am somewhat familiar with the assessment. I have never heard of the assessment. Question seven, please rate how strongly you agree with the statement. It is the government's responsibility to pass laws to protect children, i.e. seatbelt laws, consumer safety, food inspections. And the scale, strongly agree, agree, neither agree or disagree, disagree or strongly disagree. Question eight, does your community have the resources to improve life skills classes in schools? Yes, my community has plenty of the resources to improve. Yes, my community has some of the resources to improve. No, my community does not have the resources to improve this. Now please go through and answer these questions with 20 of the 39 attendees that are in here have responded. I am not allowed to vote, so y'all are going to have to vote for me. I am one of those disenfranchised like Charlotte talked about earlier. And we'll close this in about 30 seconds and then we'll get into the jam board session. And Joe, once we get the results from, from the poll, I will try to share the results of, of the poll along with, with the jam board so, so you can follow. Fantastic. And we know this is not a scientific poll, but we know y'all are the experts in the area, so we want your opinions on this. And I'm loving some of these answers. Thank y'all. I love that all of you are answering. All right, let's go ahead and end the poll and get into the jam board because it's busy over here. We are getting some great ideas from individuals.
All right, so for question 1B, how can Oklahoma improve access to quality food and physical activity for the state's youth? So if I hope all of y'all can see on the screen and we're sharing it over here on the Zoom just in case uh, you aren't able to participate in the Jamboard. And if you have any suggestions and you can't uh, put them in the Jamboard, share them in the chat section and we'll have that as a backup plan. These are some wonderful ideas. More recess for students K through five. Emphasize play and childcare school settings for young children through leadership from DHS and SDE. Part of that was uh, worked on by Representative Rosecrans with the play-based learning initiative that he authored. Each school should have a food pantry or backpack program for kids. Love that idea. OICA worked with the food banks to help them establish food pantries within the schools a few years ago. And that's not something that's been taken full advantage of in school districts across the state. We need help to raise more awareness about that. Students and parents can earn food bucks from helping at school or elsewhere, and then have farmers markets visit schools, and they can use those food bucks to pick out healthy items. Also provide recipes on how to cook the items. Another great idea, and we'll point out Oni Project, uh, one of our uh, uh, collaborative partners helps provide recipes for items on the SNAP uh, shopping list. And we're gonna be talking a lot more about SNAP tomorrow. Target food deserts with incentives for private investment. Wonderful idea. SNAP and after school activities available for exercise. Great idea. School and community gardens, one of the new ones that came up. Another wonderful idea. Address the tax system that limits municipal investment in parks and recreation, tax reform. We certainly want to work with those local communities, the Oklahoma Municipal League, to increase access to uh, local parks and raise awareness about the availability. That's an initiative we've talked about for years here. We'd like to see more happen with that. Improve safety of parks and inner city areas, frequent patrol, cleanup, et cetera. Fantastic idea. One of the uh, items uh, spurring on that is talking about ways to uh, create programs for uh, lower income families to have access to swimming pools and communities to help uh, kids learn how to swim and reduce the rate of drownings in the state. There's far too many kids in the inner city uh, didn't have that luxury like me of growing up in the country where we had farm ponds to swim in. You've, you've got to provide that opportunity for kids to learn how to swim. Increase access to all season outdoor clothing options for low income children and their parents. Swimming sandals, winter coats, gloves, and boots. We have a lot of great nonprofits working on that. And I know uh, uh, Channel 4 does a, a coat program as well as uh, some of the other TV stations. Uh, John Thompson posted in chat, we need full service community schools for our highest challenge neighborhoods. Could not agree more. I'm going to copy that and put it in here. Well, Y'all can go through here and just read these ideas that are popping up. And if you can't read it, uh, know that over here by the picture, you can click on that line and reduce the, the uh, picture of the person on screen. Peyton's on my screen right now. And you can, uh, will increase the size of the, the jam board on your screen. But these are the ideas that we want to talk about and brainstorm about, and we want to hear from you. Uh, as we're shaping this legislative agenda, we felt this was going to be the ideal way to collect ideas through a Zoom chat and make sure that your voice is heard on some of these ideas that we want to spend over the weekend drafting our legislative agenda and bringing it back for y'all to further discuss and touch on some of these points. And some of these are going to be local initiatives. Some are going to be federal. Uh, the ones at the state level are the ones that we're going to touch on and try and promote to our lawmakers. We'll have several lawmakers on throughout the week in the discussion. And keep the ideas coming. This is fantastic.
I don't know how many of you have used Jamboard before, but uh, we've loved this program when we're in other meetings. And going through the poll. I was just, sorry, Joe, can you see the, the poll results? I can. Okay, fantastic. I was gonna read through them while people were typing ideas into the Jamboard. Fantastic. Does, does Oklahoma need to invest more in quality food and physical activity opportunities? 21 out of 29 said yes, 72%. And then we had eight of the 29 answer four, uh, which is the state needs to do that and then no, it's a local and private investment. So we're gonna take that as it's state, local and private working together. And absolutely uh, appreciate those answers on that. Going to question two, the rate of child suicides has dramatically increased during the pandemic. Which of these topics is the top priority to reduce child suicide rates? Ending isolation in person learning in schools, five of the 29 voted for that. Access to mental health services, 10 of 29 voted for that. Child trauma reduction, eight of 29. And then all of the above, 15 of 29. So that's a good diversity on the answers on that. And then question. Joe, Joe yeah. I, have to, I have the follow up Jamboard question. All right, go ahead and talk about that one, Peyton. Um, the question is, what are your policy suggestions to reduce child suicide rates? And I know that we heard a lot about that today, so I'm super excited to see what y'all come up with. And if you need to switch on your Jamboard, you can see up there at the top, the one of 13, just click to the next one and that will take us to the next Jamboard where we can collect your ideas on this one. So. Please uh, go ahead and continue to type those answers in. Destigmatize therapy. Could not agree more. I was one of those people that questioned therapy until I started to doing it during the pandemic. And it's been wonderful just to take a deep breath and decompress and talk to somebody. Provide funding for the medical examiner's office to hire a full time forensic psychiatrist to review all child suicides to get a comprehensive picture of what services children received or lack thereof. Couldn't disagree with that, trying to uh, track down where the issues were. Uh, LGBTQ plus inclusive environment, schools, family support, et cetera. Uh, we talked to, uh, with Deb Shropshire yesterday about some of the improvements about uh, what DHS is doing, talking with foster families in areas like that. Uh, the state is working towards some of those goals and We've got to do a better job. Please uh, keep typing your ideas in here. What are your policy suggestions to reduce child suicide rates? Senator Floyd and Senator Kurt did an interim study on this topic with us and others a few weeks ago. And it was just a fascinating study. If you didn't get to watch it, please go back to uh, the Senate, Senate website, okaysenate.gov, and take a look at that study. Statewide media efforts to normalize mental health care as prevention care, early intervention, and intervention like physical illnesses. Support embedded mental health professionals in schools. Schools should not have to pay for this alone. Reimbursement by insurance, sooner care should be able to be used as well. This should increase equity. Increase access to school-based services by increasing the number of districts utilizing Medicaid. And that's something that Dr. Shamlin talked about earlier as far as the reimbursement rates. That's something we need to make sure we're getting that increase to a level where the doctors can do that and they can continue their practice. These are some great ideas. I'm going back to the poll, read a couple more. How prepared do you feel your community providers are as their families of children with disabilities? Nobody voted for very prepared. Seven of 29 said somewhat prepared. Two of 29 neutral, 12 of 29 somewhat unprepared, and eight of 29 very unprepared. Please rate how strongly you agree with the statement, childhood trauma is an issue in my community. 20 of 29, 69% said strongly agree. Seven of 29% or 24% said agree. 
Two of 29, 7% neither agree or disagree. No one disagreed or strongly disagreed. And looking back over at the Jamboard, we have uh, some more coming in. We must provide services where the students and families are in school or home. Absolutely. Embed social emotional curriculum requirements into child care facilities and schools. That's something very important. We need to make sure that those education leaders and mental health leaders are sharing that idea with lawmakers. Uh, we saw a heavy discussion on different curriculum policies this last session. I expect it's probably going to be like that again this session. So having that in front of the lawmakers is going to be important for them to know what the experts believe will be best for the students. And we know there is going to be a strong conversation on parental rights versus what curriculum should be as far as overall policy for kids. That's something we just need to be prepared for. Train all school staff on mental health and suicide prevention. statewide media efforts to normalize mental health care as prevention care, early intervention, and intervention like physical, oh, physical illnesses. Decrease adult-based internalized stigma through training and education. Ongoing MTSS efforts throughout schools. We know that's something the lawmakers want to do. And so that's something we can put before them that that's not going to be a heavy lift to encourage them to do that. Look at standardizing basic mental health coverage for kids requirements for private insurers. All right, and why don't we go ahead and go over to the third question where we have some people uh, putting up notes there. Question 3B, how can Oklahoma improve the way we serve families of children with disabilities? And we've got some great experts that lead nonprofits in this arena on this, so I certainly want to hear your input. Reduce or eliminate the 14 year waiting list for in-home community-based services. We could not agree more. We want that to be one of our top issues with OICA this year, especially after the conversations that happened at the end of last session and with the loft report that was delivered recently, Legislative Office of Fiscal Transparency. We appreciate the work that Mike Jackson and his team are doing over there looking at these issues. Loft is kind of like a congressional budget office that looks at issues and the budget tied around them. And the last report they delivered looked at the uh, DDSD waiting list. And so we wanna see more work happen in that to try and reduce or eliminate that list. Address shortage of community-based providers. That's the chicken and the egg. We agree completely. We've gotta find a way to make sure that those providers are out there in the community. So when we have the resources put in place, families won't struggle to have to drive a long distance to get care for a loved one and receive that care by a provider having to travel a long distance. Highlight schools providing true inclusion and best practices in the classroom. Every family needs to access to respite care or services, regardless of family income or other services they are receiving increase the family income limit to access the family support assistance payment through DDS. 
legislation requiring all teachers to have PD on IDEA, children, IDA, children's and family civil rights regarding IEPs and the 13 types of disabilities that require special services. Every teacher should know. Look at OSDH becoming involved with making sure ABA is available in all counties that have a health department location. There is an equity problem in rural areas. Some more fantastic ideas. Deploy technology and other adaptive supports earlier. Start while children are school age and maximize pay options, insurance, Medicaid, et cetera. John, thank you for the compliment. I sure appreciate your efforts a decade ago under federal regulations, a principal at a school improvement grant school who talked about ACEs was supposed to be fired. Such beliefs were called excuses. A SIG teacher who brought up trauma was supposed to be transferred out. Times have changed. We still have room for improvement, but thank goodness that that stigma is reducing and people are recognizing the issues. It's one of the reasons why we've worked so hard to reduce school suspensions and get assistance to those kids in the schools. And Emily Nichols just posted uh, the youth suicides report from the Oklahoma State Department of Health. We've used that quite a bit in our, our data that we've shared with lawmakers. Look at limits to assets and income that keep people with disabilities from being able to both work and retain health and disability supports. Promote use of stable accounts. Absolutely. Ellen Hefner would love that comment. All right, Peyton, should we go ahead and move to the next one? We already have one person sharing on here. What can we do better to contact families as a part of the assessment? And we're talking about the DDSD list here with family outreach. That was a conversation that came up that the DHS has hired a company, Liberty, to do assessments on the DDSD list. Uh, part of the problems that came up were the letters that are being sent out are English only. And we can even, if you wanna talk about a different assessment, uh, feel free to mention that in the Jamboard and talk about which assessment and what a solution would be. Address the stigma perceived blame on families that they are at fault or have caused mental health challenges. Very good. What can we do better to contact families as a part of the assessment? Question 3C. Work with community partners with closer access to families and how to connect with them. I don't know, some of y'all are skipping ahead if this is not your area of expertise or an area you uh, don't feel comfortable sharing ideas, feel free to skip around in the Jamboard and answer those questions. I know some of you are doing that. We're just going to do them in order to make sure that we can focus on each one of them.
question 4B. What are some ways Oklahoma can increase the number of children who are screened for ACEs? We've talked about that with Dr. Shamblin's idea about pediatric visits, screening the child and screening the parent slash caregiver. What are we missing out on? Or what are ways that we can get the ACEs test out there for more kids? Question 5B, please provide ways Oklahoma can reduce barriers to receiving mental health services. Question 6B, what can be done to improve children's oral health in Oklahoma? And going on question, polling question six, are you familiar with OSDH's oral health needs assessment? Five of 29, 17%, very familiar. Nine of 29%, uh, the 31%, somewhat familiar. 15 of 29, 52%, I had never heard of the assessment. All right, I am somewhat familiar, or yeah, I've never heard of the assessment. I would have been in that one, unfortunately. I appreciate Teresa bringing that to us and the conversation will spur around that. On that Jamboard, fund school-based sealant programs to deliver sealants as soon as molars erupt. I'm glad you brought that up and absolutely. Increase availability of sooner care dentists by increasing reimbursement rates. My dentist could not agree more as he does a lot of that work. Update health education instruction to include oral and health and hygiene provide incentives and or funding to recruit, retain community water fluoridation. I just have to mention that Dr. Strangelove is one of my favorite movies. And it's amazing how many people to this day think fluoridation is a bad thing. Fund OSDH Dental Health Educators Program to provide oral health education in Oklahoma classrooms. Absolutely. Fund OSDH third grade oral health assessment study to obtain vital data. Another very important factor that we need as far as collecting that information. So polling question seven, please rate how strongly you agree with this statement. It is the government's responsibility to pass laws to protect children, i.e. seatbelt laws, consumer safety, food inspections. 21 of 29, 72% said strongly agree. Eight of 29, just 28% said agree. If you look at Jamboard question seven, what more can the government do to better protect kids? We have one answer on here so far, support families, caregivers as prevention. And we would like specifics on this one. If you can think of bills that have been brought up that didn't pass or ideas that should be brought up in legislation, what are some of those government mandates or 
factors that should be strongly encouraged through laws. Pass a seatbelt law to protect children over the age of eight. Oklahoma has the youngest seatbelt law in the nation. A coalition has been working to try and overcome that. And it came close last session. It died in the House, the House committee by one vote. So we need a stronger voice on that issue. What are some of those issues out there you're aware of that the legislature should consider? Now we're over on 7B on the jam board, which is eight of 13. Thank you, Joe. John, I'm going to type yours in on this one. Public discussion of HIPAA and how can we provide feedback to serve to better provide better feedback to service providers. What more can the government do to better protect kids? This is the one I thought would be blowing up. As everybody says there ought to be a law when it comes to kids' issues, this is the one where you can provide your input. Joni, you have some fantastic suggestions that you are sending to me. Could you also send them to everyone in the chat? Two, bringing school vaccination requirements closer to CDC ACIP recommendations, as in second varicella vaccine and seventh grade meningitis vaccines and better access to vaccines and preventative care in schools. I got him ahead of myself. The polling questions tie in with the Jamboard suggestions. So I'm trying to stay on focus on that. Sorry about that, Peyton. What more can the government do to better protect kids? All right, we're gonna skip over to the next one. Eight, does your community have the resources to improve life skills classes in schools? Nobody said, yes, my, my community has plenty of access. 22 of 29 said my community has some of the resources. And 24%, seven of 29 said, no, my community does not have the resources. So question 8B, what resources does your community need to improve or provide life skills classes in schools? And I just want to add here, one of Joni's suggestions to improve children's oral health um, was actually life, life skills classes, which is a great idea. I'm going to start the ball rolling. Fund more what used to be home economics teachers for the subject. 
Oklahoma as a state, we started teaching financial literacy as a volunteer program taught by bankers. They since passed where bankers and others can come in and actually it's a requirement to teach life skills classes. We have seen far too many kids leave school not knowing how to cook a meal, not knowing how to balance a checkbook. They're not getting that at home. We know there are a lot of issues well beyond the concerns we see with foster kids, with kids in your, what is considered your average nuclear family day-to-day -day household. They graduate, leave the home not knowing how to do these basic things. Teach healthy relationship skills. Absolutely. Carol Bush and Jacob Rosecrantz worked on legislation on that a couple of years ago, and there is certainly room for improvement. And John, we're gonna talk about COVID money tomorrow. So that's an enticement to come back tomorrow. And you can skip back and forth between these questions and go look at what else should be out there. The next one, question 8C, what should be taught in life skills classes? How to apply for a job, healthy relationships, Absolutely. So I want you to scroll back and forth. If we've piqued your curiosity and thought of an idea talking about one of these and you missed your chance on the early ones, you can go back and forth and type in. We want you to submit your ideas here. And we're a few minutes over, we apologize for that, uh, but we knew this is going to be the, uh, the opportunity for each of you to submit your suggestions. And Peyton, how long will this jam board stay up? You're muted. I just realized that. We've been doing this for how long now? Oh, goodness, okay. Um, it'll be available for however long you, you want it to be. As long as people have the link, they will be able to hop on and add their su suggestions. So we want you to go throughout the day. If something just strikes you, come back and look at this. Put something in here. This, that's the beauty of this program. It can stay open even after we end the days for the conference. Teach basic health, mental health, relationship, nutrition, financial wellness, absolutely. That covers a big chunk. And what we're going to do as a staff and working with AJ is go back and look at some of these from the jam board and use your ideas to put together the legislative agenda of what we should look forward to for the next session. So this is giving you that opportunity to have your voice heard and the thoughts from your organization or your own personal thoughts put into place and they're anonymous. So if you are someone from a state agency and you don't feel like you can speak up, we don't even know who suggested these post-it notes. These are coming from anonymous people here in the system. So feel free to share your thoughts. Do not hold back. We still have a lot on 1B. So we want you to go through each of these questions and submit your ideas. And Joe, um, Joni Bruce says private du duty nursing staff is, is in crisis too. And I believe um, a part of the economic stability for Oklahoma families discussion, which is tomorrow, will discuss issues with the workforce, correct? That is absolutely correct. Yeah. Uh, I said earlier, that was the topic of my conversation or my column this week, uh, talking about the shortages in schools and the nursing profession. Yep. There, there are a lot of areas and that's gonna tie in with ARPA funding where we need to invest those resources. Absolutely. For life skills classes, how to manage money, how to invest money, teach how to calculate, amortization.
certainly teach what interest means on a credit card. That's what got me involved in the financial literacy program because I was one of those college students that had three credit cards and no job. And the banks gladly gave that to me. So I had credit card debt as well as student loan debt coming out of college. Many high school graduates do not understand the difference in a bacteria and a virus that antibiotics are used for bacteria and not for viruses. When they become parents, this is an issue. I, I believe that. <laughs> All right, so we're going to leave this open for you to come back and put your ideas in. Peyton has shared the Jamboard link. Please keep it up. And if you have a thought today, go back in and put your ideas in here. And we're gonna read back through these. As I said, my weekend is gonna be spent in front of a computer collecting your thoughts into a legislative agenda. Now, I want to go ahead and open it up just as we're finishing up. We're about 10 minutes over. Um, I want everyone who is still on here, we have 33 people still in attendance. Um, how did you feel this was? I know we don't have the best of situations with doing a virtual conference in a pandemic, but what are your thoughts about how this went? Because the next three days are certainly going to go like this and sharing ideas. So we want your input. Is This is a good way to do this. If all of you agree it's not, we're going to have to recalculate things. So if you like how we're doing this, please let us know. Because we don't want to see attendance drop off over the next couple of days. We certainly want your voice heard. So if you would type over in the chat, thank you. And we still have ideas coming in on the Jamboard. We have three likes and it went very well. If anybody out there has a negative attitude, we wanna hear that too, negative opinion. Teresa, thank you very much. We certainly like to hear that from our donors. Well, as I said at the beginning, the entire goal of this is to help us shape our legislative agenda. We want you walking away learning uh, from this and sharing ideas. We want you to take it full advantage of that in the chat. And we're selfish. We want to develop work for us for 2022 so we can go to the lawmakers early on. Spencer, thank you. Spencer is one of our rock star volunteers from across the street at the United Way. Thank you, Nikki. And a board member thought it worked great and loved the jam board. We've got to keep our bosses happy. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, we've got our, our staff, our team on here. Uh, so I want to thank Peyton for running the jam board and helping with a lot of the policy work, helping develop the, the conversation on the policy. Sarah helped put together the polling and helped run that. Christine has been running the entire operation for Zoom in her office. Lauren, our intern, is monitoring the chat, helping us make sure we catch ideas. Whitney is also helping with that area. And Jay is writing down notes so we can make sure we have everything communicated properly because we know a lot of this will go out to the press as far as the ideas. and. If anybody uh, from the press wants to talk to an individual about any of these areas, we have your organizations when you signed up. So if someone wants to talk about something specifically in your wheelhouse, we may reach out to some of you for comments. Beverly, thank you. I love working with you. Thank you, Dr. Shamblin. And we hope to be back in person. Um, we will try and do a combination of this. If we have access to a facility, uh, for years, we've used Chesapeake's Green Room, and we know on their large screen, we would be able to do something with Jamboard like this. So as we get back into 
coming together and working together. I know we're going to take a lot of these ideas and use those for the in-person ball form in the future. One thing I do want to mention is Monday, we've combined uh, the conference with our chili cook-off. So go to our website, oica.org, and click on the Political Hacks Chili Cook-off for a lunch on Monday for those in the Oklahoma City Metro. We'd encourage you to sign up and come by and pick up samples of our chili. Uh, more importantly, we're doing a blood drive here in the office. Any of you that are able to donate blood, uh, please plan on coming by any time from 11 to 2 on Monday to donate blood. We still have 19 spots left for people to sign up, and we committed to the blood drive. We would finish those up. So not only yourself, but please share in your office that if individual wants to sign up at the link we have on our uh, Facebook page, we want you to sign up for that blood drive. You will get to eat, sample the chili here as well as all the treats that they have. And we'll have t-shirts for the conference on sale. Those are up on our Facebook page as well. I uh, just want any of you to be involved. Uh, someone private chat me, Dr. Dorman, uh, I only wish, <laughs> but thank you for that. Um, sign up for the blood drive, please share with your offices and let's, let's try and get as much uh, as we can for a donation here because the blood drive blood institute really needs that donation and we've got our chili if you don't want to donate blood and you just want to drive through and pick up chili you'll have that chance to sign up and we will have our team bring out the samples to you and you can take it back to your office or home and sample those chilies and then vote online for your favorite uh we're hoping uh since we couldn't provide a meal to you for the conference we were hoping our chili cook off would at least provide a free lunch to you. If you have any questions, message me. I am putting my email in here, in the chat. Joe, the recorded video of the first day, that will be up on our website, is that correct? That's correct. As soon as uh, we can get it converted over, we'll have that in there and share. So. I just put my uh, email here, jdorman at oica.org. If you have questions about the blood drive or the chili cook-off, or if you want to, if you, if you want to cook, we still have time for people to enter and we want people to cook on Sunday. We have sample cups with lids. We will get those to you this week. We have about six people competing in the chili cook-off right now. We'd love to have some more. And our team is going to assemble those samples Monday morning and have them ready for people to pick up and we're gonna do a few deliveries to some people. Um, let's just have a fun conference as much as we possibly can with the activities that we've implemented into this and certainly with the ideas. The Jamboard page I'm on, we had another one just pop up. So continue to put those ideas in place. We're going to go ahead and wrap things up as far as the Zoom chat. As I said, the Jamboard's gonna be up and running for a while. So continue to put your ideas in. And we will share some of the uh, PowerPoints and pages with the attendees that registered uh, as the uh, presenters send those to us. And we will have those on our website as well. Thank you to each of you for being a part of the first day of Fall Forum. And we will see you tomorrow. Uh, it begins at 845 with the vendor fair for TSET. And so if what people want to log on early, we will have some music for you. I will have the coffee here in the office. I hope you have coffee in your office too, and we'll have a full day. So with that, thank you, and we'll see you tomorrow.